Good morning. Today is Monday, December 6, 2021. Commissioner's Court is meeting in regular open mm -hmm. session. Today we are joined by ASL interpreters Dario Garcia and Selena Saloum. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Olguin, would you like to introduce our Pledge of Allegiance class today? Yes, thank you, Jessica. It is my absolute honor to be able to introduce the student council, the second grade student council at Sambrano Elementary School in San Elisario, who will be leading us in the pledge. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. We'll be right wait with you. Let us stand up and then we'll get started. Please thank rise you. for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, boys and girls. Honor the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one individual. That, that was excellent. Uh, you, you're part of a great, great uh, community there at San Alisario. We thank you. Uh, Commissioner Olguin, thank you for always. Uh, gathering all these incredible individuals. I hope you have a wonderful day. And that is not easy to say the Pledge of Allegiance uh, in harmony with so many children. So thank you very much for that. And you have a wonderful day. Uh, make sure you, you appreciate your teachers, okay? They're doing an amazing job in your superintendent and principal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's going to be a highlight of <laughs> the day. And now an invocation by Pam Ferroni. Thank you, Mrs. Ferroni. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners, and all who are within the sound of my voice. Please join me as I pray, if you so choose. Almighty Elohim, we come boldly before your throne on this new day with gratitude and thanksgiving, inviting your presence into these commissioner court, commissioner's court proceedings. Let everything that is said and every decision that is made be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Teach us to put your principles into practice, for you know exactly how we should live that will cause us to receive and walk in your blessings. Let us bring every decision that is made into the light of the noonday sun for all to see and understand. We pray, dear Father, that you will bless El Paso County government. Please guide each of our leaders and every member of this court that they may govern righteously. For your word is clear that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Let the pressure that sometimes weighs on our county employees be lifted. Touch those who are carrying heavy personal burdens and those who put on a smile and come to work even when their hearts are breaking. You know the deepest needs of our souls and we trust you to walk with us even when it feels like we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We take authority over the atmosphere and we give you permission to work in the hearts of those of us who love you and are called according to your purposes. Thank you for the beloved people of our county. Help us all to be good neighbors and good citizens. We choose not to be like sheep who are led astray, but to be like sheep who know the voice of their good shepherd and who follow after him. Let your goodness and your mercy follow us all the days of our lives and let us dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, your incarnate son, we pray, amen, and so be it. Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Ferroni. As you said, it's great to, to have you live, and uh, we always welcome you. So thank you very much. The best to your son and to your great uh, husband. Thank you.
Judge, would you like to make some opening comments before we begin? Yeah, I just want to welcome all of you on, on behalf of our commissioners and, and myself. We'd like to, to welcome you to our county government, and we always appreciate uh, having you here and being part uh, throughout the day. As I've always said, there's so much information. Uh, please let others know that uh, you could uh, come in uh, through internet and, and, and find out what's going on in county government through the day. So I also want to just a special appreciation for what took place this Saturday at night, you know, a night of hope. And, uh, you know, it was just incredible. Uh, the number of people that were there, the participants that showed up, and the um, amount of appreciation that they had for first responders, healthcare workers, uh, all the medical personnel that uh, go through so much. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to understand. There are hidden heroes that are back there uh, working long hours, and, and uh, right now there are some challenges at the hospital already. And so we thought uh, as we move in, we don't know what's going to be taking place in the next uh, few days, but uh, we, we do see some, some concern, especially in the hospital. So it was a great opportunity to thank them. It was a great opportunity to let them know that we appreciate them. Uh, as we said, you know, as we light up the light on the lake, uh, we also wanted to light up their hearts. And, and we're very uh, concerned about uh, what they have to go through. So if you see one, uh, you know, talk to them, tell them we appreciate them, uh, let them know how much we care for them. And as I said, we also inclu included teachers because teachers have, are being challenged quite a bit in trying to figure out how to keep the children safe and, you know, whether or not there's a mandate and, what, you know, a lot of things taking place uh, and they're right in the, in the middle. So I see them as at the forefront as well. So once again, we welcome you. I think you're going to enjoy the great resolutions that are going to be taking place uh, uh, to, to begin with. And, uh, you know, just very, very appreciative that you're all here today. Thank you. Item number four is the consent agenda composed of items 4A through 4AM. We do have a request to delete item 4M. Item 4M reads, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the first amendment to services agreement between County of El Paso, Texas and United Way of El Paso County to exp expand ERA treasury funded services eligibility and align the term date with the contractor's obligation term end date to February 15, 2022. Contract number 2021-0933. This item will be brought back at a later time. And a correction for item 4O. The item should read, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the second amendment to the agreement for professional services to develop a cultural landscape report and historic structures report of Oñate Crossing at Old Fort Bliss and Hearts Mill with Paleo West Archaeology. Funding in the amount of $7,289 is available in SR Tourist Promotion Operation Expenses. Contract number 2021-0917. Are there any items members of the court or public would like to pull for further discussion? Yeah, Judge, I'd like to, uh, D and E. Go ahead. Letter D and E. D and E, okay. Okay, are there any other items? No. I move to approve as said. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Commissioner Robinson is absent. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Judge, we have some items that will be postponed. Would you like to pull those and Yes, please. Yes. Uh, For item read. number eight, okay, under Commissioner's Court, discuss and take appropriate action to renew the emergency ambulance service agreement with Life Ambulance Service, Inc. And we ask for this item to be postponed for one week. Yes, so uh, we, uh, Commissioner Robinson brought this item up and he will not be with us today, so uh, I would like to ask the court to postpone that. Move to postpone. S second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. And Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. And the second item to be postponed is item 11, correct? Yes, and uh, just go ahead and read it okay. and then I'll come. Item number 11, discuss and take appropriate action 
regarding the interlocal agreement by and between El Paso County and Housing Opportunity Management Enterprises regarding operations in El Paso County. Contract number 2021-0948. And you'd like for one week postponement? Uh, yes, and the reason for that is because of the uh, importance of the item and not having full commissioner's court present. And so I'd like to ask the court if we could postpone it until we get uh, Commissioner Robinson uh, to be on this topic. So moved. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. And Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Apologize for those that attended today, but I did uh, confirm with them that, uh, that that would be taking place, or at least that we're going to vote for that. Thank you, Jerry and everyone. Thank you. Okay, Judge, and the next item we'd like to move to, we do have several students here in the audience, mm -hmm. will be item number 7A, presentation. Receive a presentation from the El Paso County Elections Department recognizing the winners of the 2022 I Voted sticker contest. Thank you. Lisa, thank you. Good morning, Judge, Good Commissioners. Morning. This is um, one of the pleasures of my job, a, a real joy. Um, two years ago, we started this I Voted sticker contest to um, reach out to all local high school students throughout the county and ask for submissions to be used for um, all elections during the 2020 cycle. We received so, uh, so much positive feedback from, from teachers, from the community, but one of the things they asked uh, was, why can't we open it up to middle school? Uh, we have some students who are really starting to get engaged in the process and we'd like to maybe offer something to them. And so we, we thought about it and we said, let's come back in two years and then offer it um, just to the, the middle school students in the county. And again, it was, uh, we were so lucky. We had so many um, teachers and community members who agreed to do the judging, uh, which is not easy. Um, I removed myself from that process simply because it is so difficult to do. Um, we received over 68 submissions throughout the county for the middle school. Um, sticker contest, and I'm going to kind of go over a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about their designs, and then they're here uh, in person to receive their their designs, and also um, if they want to address the court at all a little bit. So, like I said, um, we definitely want to thank the teachers and school administrators, some of who are here today, for encouraging the students to participate. Um, and I'll take the next slide. Here you go. I'll take the next one after that too. I already covered this. So in third place, we have um, a wonderful design from Luna Robledo, a sixth grader at Hanks Middle School. Unfortunately, Luna is not able to be here in person. I, she uh, had wanted to call in. I'm not sure if um, they were able to, um, but she is participating with her family remotely and, and watching it. So um, her design... Let's yeah, she's, some, uh, she's there. Uh, Luna, I think they are participating. Oh, I heard excellent. some cheering. Excellent. Um, if Miguel, we could have that third place design sticker up on the screen. That's the third place. Again, that's Luna Robledo from Hanks Middle School, a sixth grader. Um, it, it's, it's gorgeous. People, all of the judges um, had a really hard time with these top three, but um, that, was our, that was our third place. She place is on winner. teams. She is on teams. She is on, okay. Hi, Luna, you want to tell us a little bit about your design? Can you go ahead and unmute yourself, Luna? You're muted right now, Luna. Hi, Luna, can you hear us? Uh, you're, you're muted. I did just wanted to represent El Paso. Well, thank you, Luna. You, you should be very proud of your design. Excellent. Thank you. Wish you were here, but I know sometimes that can't happen. So thank you for, for being on. Go and, ahead, Lisa. And Luna's instructor from Hanks is here. And so he'll be taking the shadow box and everything and making sure that, that Luna gets that. Excellent. Congratulations. S our second place goes to Jair Herrera, a sixth grader at Devalle Middle School. 
Um, he is present today, so he'll be able to um, to uh, talk to you and, and uh, make any comments if, if he'd like to. Um, that's the uh, obviously the star on the mountain, um, very colorful, and um, just a really great a really great drawing. Our first place winner goes to Miss Leila Gonzalez, who is a seventh grader at Aldorete Middle School in Canatillo. This will be your 2022 I Voted sticker. So starting with the primary in March, the runoff, our uniform election in May, and then again in November, these will be the stickers that, that will be handed out. Um, she'll be given an opportunity as well to, to talk a few minutes if she'd like. Um, so before I so go on to bringing I them up, I just wanted to uh, thank our judges. Every time we do this, we get such a good response from the community, um, and we, we reach out to leaders, uh, art, art leaders in the, in the county. Um, this year, we were able to, uh, we had Kristen Apodaca. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with her. She's an illustrator and muralist in the county. Um, she sat on the, on the panel. We also had um, Ms. Chelsea Avalde from uh, Chuka Relic who also served on the panel. Um, and I can't tell you, these guys have a really tough job. I mean, it's going through almost 70 submissions and going back and, and revisiting them and, and deciding on the final winner. And it, it's, it's definitely not an easy job. And our final judge was um, Miss Miriam Garcia, who is the public art program supervisor um, for the city. So uh, again, we had some uh, amazing leaders from the community who agreed to come in um, go through the go through all of the designs and and agree on a winner. So I want to thank all of them and then offer um, Either one of the participants and their family to come up if they'd like to just say a few words Absolutely, and before we do that I'd like Lisa. I'd like to thank you I don't know people don't quite understand the dynamics of your job and and, and what what it uh, you know everything that you have to do to make sure that people vote and and we thank you for that one of the things that is very important in El Paso is that we need to increase voter participation. And these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, activities and initiatives really help. And, and I know people will sort of want to do things because of, of all these young people. And the judges, thank you so much for, for participating. And um, I, I saw your, your background and talents and to have that level of judges is, is really nice. To, so thank you, judges, thank you. Lisa, for everything that you do and your team as Thank well. You. Yeah, it's our it's our pleasure. Honestly, we love going out and getting um, you know the younger people involved and starting them as soon as we can so that they'll develop the habit of being interested in, in civics and, and voting. So yeah, please, I'm going to offer um, invite the uh, first and second place if they want to come up. Absolutely, we would love to say have a few words. Jayad and want to come up, Leila. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jaid, and I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. You could stay stay up here if you don't if you don't mind staying up here, Jared, so you could. Yeah, just go ahead and stay up here. Here, if you don't come up, we'll bring, bring the mic to you, okay? So <laughs> you won't escape. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Layla. <laughs> I need to say thank you. Um, Thank you, Layla, that your, your artwork, both of you, is just uh, incredible. And I hope you realize that that will motivate a lot of people. So you're going to be responsible for a better uh, voter participation, and that should make you feel really good, something that you want to always carry with you, that you were part of this, uh, this great initiative to get people to come out and vote. When we don't vote, we lose, because that means that we don't have the power to make decisions and, and the right people in, in place. So thank you both. I hope you realize the importance of, of this initiative. Thank you. Judge? Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Leon, please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't don't sit on yet. I, I just wanted to congratulate you. And, and just looking at the artwork, uh, I'm 100% I'm, I'm voter, but I really want to vote this time because I want that sticker. And uh, Lisa, if you put the other slide where all of them were, were there, 
it seems you're right. How can you make a decision? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't a judge. And congratulations to both of you. And, and uh, I know that the entire court is so proud of you. So congratulations. And, and I'm going to get one of those and keep it. Thank you. And Luna, thank you. Yeah, you you're, you're a big part here. Talented. Thank you. So you, if you want to come up and we can yeah, take their picture. Did you see that once where all of them? I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Galaviz, the superintendent of Canotillo. Uh, it's not often, but this is really shows the, uh, for him to be here today, really shows the commitment from, from that school district. So thank you. Okay. And, and now back to the regular order of the agenda. Item 5A, resolutions. Approve and adopt a resolution recognizing the contributions made by Don Shapiro, founder of the famous national brand Action West, to El Paso County. Commissioner Stout. Yes. Um, good morning. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Um, I'm very honored to be able to read this resolution into the record. Um, believe it or not, I just met Mr. Shapiro a couple of weeks ago and, and have been learning about his 
his story, uh, you know, uh, moving from New York uh, to El Paso and setting up shop here and, and having a very successful business and continuing to be a very successful businessman, but also a philanthropist and, and somebody who, who really, I think, has a passion for the arts. I think it's great that we had the uh, presentation of, the, uh, of the, the kids who participated in this, um, this contest this morning, as well as this resolution. And, and we have another resolution, I believe, this morning on, on a, um, uh, with some other folks that are, that are dealing with the arts and film. And so uh, I wanted to uh, uh, thank Mr. Shapiro and, of course, uh, Valentin Sandoval, who uh, is, is, has been working with Mr. Shapiro at, at Power of the Past to try and help uh, local artists uh, do what they do what they do best and 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 foment that industry and and so I want to go ahead and read the resolution into the record and then Mr. Shapiro will have you come up to the podium and say a few few words if that's okay and and also Valentin uh, so whereas Don and Bobby Shapiro came to El Paso 66 years ago and were among the leading pioneers of the garment manufacturing era and the twin plant operations in El Paso and Juarez. And whereas Don started Action West and created 750 jobs in El Paso and 3,000 jobs in Mexico from Torreon, Puebla, and Chihuahua, and helped put Western clothing style on the international map. And whereas Bobby Shapiro was highly involved in the theater, performance, and PBS television shows throughout the past 60 years, and whereas Don and Bobby Shapiro raised a family of three children who helped him build up Action West Industries, Lori Shapiro graduated from Parsons and helped with fashion and design, and his two sons, Steve and Randy Shapiro, have become major businessmen of their own. Steve is a real estate broker, and Randy has become business partners with Paul Foster and Happy, and Happy Tales, a global pet, pet product company. And whereas Don Shapiro continues to build Don Shapiro Industries, co-wrote his book, Power at the Pass, and is helping to build up the regional movie industry. And whereas Don and Bobby Shapiro continue to support the local art community by creating a unique space that incubates art, entrepreneurship, and multimedia promotions, theater, and story creation. And now, therefore, be it resolved that El Paso County Commissioner's Court hereby recognizes Don Shapiro for all his work and accomplishments, past, present, and future. Signed this sixth day of December 2021 by the Honorable County Commissioner's Court. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. So Valentina and Mr. Shapiro, would you like to step up to the, to the podium and, and, and say a few words for us? I'll, uh, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, I'll, pre I'll preface this with, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, it, it was uh, our constant idea to, to, for me to pay homage to Don Shapiro upon knowing him for five years now and partnering with him and, and having co-authored his book and currently adapting that book into a screenplay. Um, you know, he, the, the man really is a remarkable uh, American citizen in, in that World, you know, World War II vet. He didn't get a chance to go, you know, fight in the Philippines where he really wanted to, and and Nagasaki and Hiroshima went off, and so now he was one of the first recipients of the GI Bill, and with that he went to NYU and he became a, you know, he got his degree in finance, but his his event, his his calling was always people, and humanity and culture and art. So he came in on a road trip and he came to El Paso 67 years ago approximately. And he fell in love immediately with the horizons and the open skies and the culture and the desert and the texture of the people in the frontera. He saw nothing but opportunity. So, you know, I was lucky enough to write his story and, and, and partner with him in the process of knowing what it really means to create opportunities and, and, and you, utilizing your originality and your culture and the person that you are. And, and so that I think he's the consummate prototype or archetype of of, of what we can aspire to with, with originality and with an edge and with an entrepreneurial genius and a resiliency that continues to have him 
go on to social media and, 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 become, and start a, an internet company and now you know, content creation and now possibly making a movie and a TV series is, uh, is something that you know, is, is of the ages and, and he's a very proud El Paso and so I, you know, I want to thank you guys for you know, thank, you know, the court for acknowledging this and I just wanted to have Don say some, some words. Thank you, Valentin. I want to thank all of you for the honor, it's beyond belief. I love the people, I love El Paso, I love everything that's happened from day one. I want to thank you for the great honor and we will continue working with everybody in a positive way forever in building up El Paso greater than ever. Thank you for everything. Thank you, uh, Valentin. Thank you for that great uh, introduction. Uh, I, got, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Don Valentino, I, and I'll use Don uh, as we use it with great honor in, in our heritage and our culture, but uh, it's been, it was such a great pleasure. I got to, to go through your place of work, and, and it was just a, a, incredible, the things that you've done, and the timing of having one of our next resolutions, and I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, Commissioner, thank you. This is a, a great connection that that they could make uh, and, and share. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of this industry here in El Paso. But uh, Mr. Shapiro, we, we thank you for everything that you've done for El Paso and for keeping our, our heritage alive and our history alive. And, and thank you for, for, for just everything that you do. It's, it's just, a, you're an amazing man. And uh, we thank you for that. Commissioner? Yep, thank you. Um, thanks, Judge. And, and again, thank you so much for for being here and, and allowing us to, to honor you with this with this resolution, uh, both you and your wife. I had the pleasure of meeting her this weekend for the first time, and what a lovely woman! Uh, you know, uh, you 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 both have have uh, just done great things for El Paso and Juarez, and and I, I think that uh, this this city and this region probably would not be the same without the contribution that you all have made, and are continuing to make. And and so thank you for also fomenting the arts and working with Valentin to, to help do that. I think that it's such a, a, a great uh, endeavor that you all are, that you all are embarking upon there. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to support that any way that I, that I can. So thank you very much. I want to thank you all for everything, especially the honor and mainly the people of El Paso who have given me an opportunity of the lifetime, I want to thank you all. I fully appreciate the city, the people, and everything about it. Thank you. And I'd like to pay tribute to Valentin also. I think he's, uh, uh, people aren't aware of everything, everything that he does and uh, behind the scenes and uh, just has been just an incredible partner with uh, Mr. Shapiro. So Valentin, thank you also for, for your work and, and your contribution to this community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Can y'all can y'all come up here so we can take a picture? Let's make a connection. <laughs> it's going to be really important.
Item 5B, approve and adopt a resolution declaring that November 22nd will be now known as Project Always Beside You Day in El Paso County, Texas. Commissioner Olguin. Thank you, Judge. Um, so, unfortunately, we weren't able to um, get to this resolution last month because of the holiday, so we're a little bit late, but I certainly wanted to make sure that this organization did not go without being recognized. Um, so I'm going to read the resolution into the record, and then I know that we have a couple of speakers here who are going to be speaking um, on behalf of the resolution. Whereas the Diaz family lost their beloved son, Christopher Diaz, while he was serving overseas on September 28, 2011. And whereas Staff Sergeant Diaz was a United States Marine Corps canine handler and a third generation Marine. And whereas Staff Sergeant Diaz's canine, Dino, was retired from the Marine Corps and adopted by the Diaz family and subsequently passed away in December of 2020 from meningitis complications. And whereas on November 22nd, 2020, the Diaz family received a 501c3 designation for a nonprofit organization in El Paso, Texas called Project Always Beside You to honor all canine handlers and their dogs. And whereas Project Always Beside You provides financial support for canines and handlers when they experience unexpected hardships. Their support extends to canines and handlers who are active duty military, veteran, or retired, and their families, and includes those in a government service related working environment. And whereas Project Always Beside You represents an organization that honors the memory of Staff Sergeant Christopher Diaz and that of his canine, Dino, and whereas Project Always Beside You continues to represent fallen service members, fallen canine handlers, and all canine dogs in our community and nation. Therefore, be it resolved by the Commissioner's Court of the County of El Paso that November 22nd, 2021 will now be known as Project Always Beside You Day. In official recognition thereof, the Commissioners of the Court hereby affix their signatures this sixth day of December, 2021 in El Paso, Texas. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. And we have um, Staff Sergeant Diaz's parents, Sal and Sandra Diaz, with us, and also Aldina Hajer, who is the Precinct 3 appointee to the County's Veteran Advisory Board. If they could step up to the microphone, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we want to thank you, Judge, very much, and commissioners. Thank you for everything you've done. And um, last but not least, Aldina, for getting to meet her and uh, all her support as well. Uh, a little bit about Project Always Beside You. Like uh, Commissioner Ogin mentioned, it all started with, uh, with the death of our son, Christopher. And we, what we would do is honor him and other fallen dog handlers from the Vietnam War all the way to the present wars that we've had. And by doing that is we, uh, we have a two day event that we host in September on his uh, anniversary date. And what that consists of is we invite uh, guest speakers. We've had the assistant chief of police from here in El Paso. We've had majors, we have some generals. We've had uh, other local business owners that have come and spoke at the, the time of the memorial. And uh, that's usually, we started off on a Friday and we welcome everybody and everything. And we start off on Saturday uh, with a short prayer at the site at Fort Bliss where our son is, is laid to rest. And it's, it's about an hour or so when we get to meet people that have come in from all different parts of the states. We've had people from North Carolina, from Washington, DC, from Virginia, parts of Texas, uh, California, all over. So they come in. Uh, some of the Gold Star families that, that we've gotten to meet through, throughout this journey also come down and visit us, and, and we all kind of share the same, you know, same heartache and pain, uh, as well as love for, for our loved ones. So that happens on a, on a, on a Saturday, and after we're done with that, uh, with that memorial and, and the guest speakers, is my wife and I and our, and our other two boys and family and friends, we, we host a, a barbecue 
for all invited guests and for all dog handlers and their families that have come in locally and from, like I said, other states. And we feed them a steak. We feed the dog handlers and their families a steak. Uh, it is all done by, uh, by donations. Everything that, that we get, we've asked for local companies that have helped us as well. So we do that, and we probably feed about, um, about four to 500 people during this, during this event. And we acknowledge everybody that's, that has helped us throughout the year on, uh, on donations and anything that they've done to help us to um, remember our loved ones. You know, not just only Chris, like I said, but every other Gold Star family that's out there. So we do that, and um, probably we get done on a Saturday at about 8, 9 o'clock at night. By the time we're done feeding, acknowledging everybody. And in Sunday morning, we have a competition uh, in Socorro. We have a, a property, an acre of property, with 30 pecan trees. And within the pecan trees, we have a military spec obstacle course. So we have dog handlers that come in from Border Patrol, from Bortec, uh, El Paso PD. We have Fort Bliss. We have Holloman Air Force Base. We have Kirtland Air Force Base. We've had people from San Antonio. We've had uh, students that are in the dog program there that, that come down for this. We've had people from North Carolina, from South Carolina. So it's all branches and local law enforcement. Like I said, so what we do is we have a competition that consists of five, uh, five categories. We do detection of drugs, detection of explosives. We do the hardest bite. We do an obstacle course, and we do obedience. Not everybody has to get in all five, uh, five of, those, uh, of those topics. We, you can pick and choose whatever you want, or you can do all five. Usually the military are the ones that do all five. The, the local governments, they don't do certain things that the military doesn't do. And so we try to make it, balance it out, and make it, make it fun and make it uh, on a level playing field. Don't always work that way, but uh, we try to. So we host all of that, and um, we break for lunch, and again, we feed everybody that's there. Once we're done with a competition of all five categories, we tally everything up, and we give out trophies and, and bragging rights for each category, and then we do what we call a top dog of all five categories, and we grab that all together, and then we give, we give out the awards. After that, we break away, and we continue for the next year. So during that time, we had adopted Dino, and uh, I'd say the first part of, of last year, Dino, we started seeing some things with Dino that, uh, that weren't good. You know, he started having some seizures. He uh, would fall a lot. Um, a lot of different things were happening at that time. So, you know, he would go to the vet, and uh, when you adopt a military working dog, you don't get the, uh, the help from the, from the military. Pretty much, you sign, up, you sign some waivers that you can't, uh, you know, train them as what their, what their MOS is, what their job function is. So you do that, and um, they do, do a lot of the medical. Uh, they do uh, spade and neuter them, depending on the, type, the breed of the animal or, or the sex. And you have to sign a bunch of forms that you can't do a lot of things, which is fine. I mean, there's something that we, we got that was part of our son. So that, that, brought, that didn't bring closure. But it brought some comfort that knowing that my wife says that uh, our son Chris was actually touching Dino and spend a lot of time with him, you know, 24-7. They were, if I mean, I'll go back a little bit. They, they were partnered together when our son Christopher went to Israel and trained with the Israeli army for um, the type of, um, type of job duty that he had, that he was bringing to the Marine Corps and then taking it to Afghanistan. So that's where they partnered up, and they met when uh, Dino was four was four years old. And um, they trained with the Oketz Army. So they came home and uh, they, Christopher continued some training here in, in Arizona and in California where he was stationed out of, and then got themselves and prepared 40 Marines to go to Afghanistan. So Christopher actually came back as a train the trainer in this type of, of uh, search, uh, which was a uh, off-leash type search. Christopher could send a Dino, uh, 300 yards away and have him on a camera and we could be looking at him right here and Dino would detect any bombs that were up to no more than 300 yards away and then Chris would call him back. Uh, Dino took his commands in, uh, in English and in Hebrew, mainly Hebrew, that, that's how Christopher and, and Dino communicated. So when Dino started getting, getting ill, we, uh, we had our vet, but the the bills and stuff that you see and, and the charges from the veterinarians, they get to be high. 
So they get to, uh, they do take a toll on the family. You know, stress falls in and where are you going to get X amount of dollars to pay for this and to pay for that. So we reached out to a couple of agencies ourselves, a couple of organizations that were on the East Coast. There is nothing in our area closer than about 900 miles away. A lot of our veterans don't know that our canine handlers or local law enforcement know that there's organizations like this that can help. So they helped us out. And uh, when Dino finally got ill in December, in November, uh, Dino and I drove out to uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. There was a, a hospital there in Arizona that could only do, that perform that surgery that Dino needed. There was nobody here in El Paso. Uh, my wife was in uh, New York taking care of our baby grandson where, where our, our, one of our sons lives up in Buffalo. So it took a toll because I was handling this on my own and it, it was kind of rough. Um, but, you know, my wife and I would talk and the kids, and so we started reaching out to an organization. Well, long story short, this organization that we reached out to, the president and founder of that organization was actually our son's trainer when he went to Yuma, Arizona. So he knew of Christopher and he knew of Dino. Him and Dino and Christopher trained on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, for what Chris and Dino were going to Afghanistan for. So they helped us out, and um, during that time, my wife and I, Sandra and I, were like, we, were, we already knew that we were planning the, uh, the nonprofit, but we didn't know which way to go. So when this happened with Dino, we figured, why don't we do this and help other families that have adopted military dogs or local law enforcement dogs. So we put in for the, uh, for the nonprofit, for the 501C, and we were awarded the 501C in, uh, in November of last year. So that's where we are today. You know, it's, it's been great. Uh, we've partnered up with the El Paso Chihuahuas. They've partnered up with us, actually. Uh, right now, we're in the stages of probably going national with uh, Homeland Security. And uh, we've actually placed our first veteran Marine with the dog. So we're also doing that as well. So we reached out to uh, El Paso Animal Services, and uh, they helped us match a pup with uh, one of the veterans here locally in El Paso that has PTSD. And there's a local company here in El Paso that's also helping us, and uh, they'll be getting trained to become a service dog, which is great. So that's some accomplishments that we, we look forward to, and hopefully we can have many more. And with your all support, uh, we really do appreciate that. And this is, a, this is an honor of, uh, of being here, and uh, you guys acknowledging what we do, and Aldina as, as well. So thank you so much for everything. Yes. Thank you. No, thank Mrs. you. Diaz, would you like to... Aldina, did you want to say a few words? <laughs> but thank you so much. He did so well, right? It's very Aldina, good. would you like to comment? I just wanted to thank you, Commissioner Holguin, as always supporting the veteran initiatives in our community, and of course, County Judge and the rest of the commissioners as well. You guys have been truly amazing, and, and I really do appreciate every little bit of effort that you guys have put in into making El Paso even more veteran friendly. I mean, we're, we're expanding so much and it's organizations like this that make us who we are as a community, you know, organizations, no matter how small they are and no matter how minuscule they're, you know, to, to some people it may seem their mission, but in reality, it's the work they do in the background. Uh, I had the honor actually of going to Holloman Air Force Base with Sal and Sandra and we fed one of the uh, canine uh, groups there and it, it was amazing. My son went with me. He had a blast. He wanted to pet every single canine that came around. <laughs> and we're like, no petting, you know, just leave him alone. Enjoy the view. You know, they're awesome, amazing dogs. But it's been, it's been an honor to know Sal. Uh, and it was crazy because when I formally got introduced to Sandra and we're like, wait a minute, we know each other. I actually know her from what, uh, what we used to do, and I'm sure you are aware, County Judge, uh, Veteran Stand Down. So she was yeah. out one of our main cooks. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was, we're like, wait a minute, I know you, you know me, what? <laughs> so it's been amazing. I, I really, truly appreciate every single one of you for everything that you have done for our community, for the veteran community. It's been an honor to, to stand by every single one of you and to have your support making El Paso one of the greatest cities for veterans. Thank you. And, and you well, know, it's, you. Uh, what an amazing uh, tribute to Christopher 
And, you know, when something's driven by the heart, it's just amazing what you accomplish. And, and I know you have that passion. Uh, and you touch so many different elements of, you know, from a, a Gold Star family, which I'm, I'm, I'm part of that because of my brother, Chito. And uh, just uh, being, you know, allowing them to understand that we do care for them. And they're going through very difficult times when they need a partner to be next to them. Uh, I've seen them at here at the, at the elevator, and, and you could see this, the sense of confidence and security of having a canine next to them. And uh, so just, uh, you know, we're building all these blocks, as you've said, and thank you for, for saying that about our, our community, our veterans community. Uh, working very hard, have reached out to a lot of different people about us being the uh, veterans capital of the U.S., and I think all of these are little building blocks. Uh, that will justify. We have a new uh, person at Destination El Paso who's a veteran who's very excited, uh, just came in, uh, took over for Brian uh, Crow, and, and so we're, we're excited. And these are the things that lead up to that. And, and of course, uh, everyone here, very supportive uh, to the veterans community. I hope you have a chance to take a picture in front of our Hall of Fame there, our, our, our wall there, that uh, we honor all the different missions. And uh, Commissioner Olguin, thank you so much for for this, and we, we do apologize, we're a little late, but uh, next time we'll be on time. So Definitely, no, <laughs> thank you so much, thank you, I really appreciate it, and, and like you said, uh, Judge, um, it's, it's the little things that make it possible, uh -huh. you know, it's these little events, these little uh, pieces of honoring small different parts of our community, whether it's veteran or not, that make me proud to be an El Paso, and thank you. Well, thank you. Well, and, and I just wanted to thank Aldina for bringing this incredible organization to our attention, and of course, thank Mr. and Mrs. Diaz for uh, recognizing that there was this gap and stepping up to make sure that it was filled, and of course, more than anything, for your family's sacrifice on behalf of our country. Um, so I did want to present you with a flag that was flown over the courthouse from November 22nd to November 29th. So if you'll give me a second, we're going to get that to you. Thank you for all you do for us. Jessica? Item 5C, approve and adopt a resolution proclaiming December as Military Sexual Trauma Awareness Month in El Paso County, Texas, by recognizing and advocating for veterans who are victims of military sexual trauma and celebrating the bravery and strength of survivors.
Thank you, Jessica. Um, so it's my honor to read this resolution into the record, uh, recognizing all of the um, tremendous contributions in this area made by our very own um, State Senator Cesar Blanco, who I believe is on the line with us today. Um, so I will go ahead and read the resolution and then pass it over to Senator, good morning, Senator, for some comments. Good morning. Whereas El Paso County honors and pays tribute to U.S. Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen, her family, and concerned citizens who relentlessly fought for justice for her and other victims of military sexual trauma. Whereas military sexual trauma refers to sexual assault or sexual harassment experienced during military service. El Paso County recognizes that both male and female service members from all social and economic backgrounds and military ranks have experienced military sexual trauma. Whereas we recognize Texas Senator Cesar Blanco who championed reforms to combat military sexual assault in the Texas military forces and who ultimately authored and passed Senate Bill 623 formally titled the Vanessa Guillen Act in the Texas 87th legislature. SB 623 supports victims of sexual assault in the Texas military forces with additional resources and avenues for justice. The bill establishes a sexual assault response coordinator outside of the chain of command to receive reports of sexual assault and provide victim advocacy services. SB 623 also designates a Texas Ranger under the Department of Public Safety of the State of Texas as an independent criminal investigator for allegations of sexual assault in the Texas military forces. Whereas SB 623 establishes that military protective orders are sufficient grounds to grant civilian ex parte protective orders for victims of military sexual assault, provides victims with certain notifications of rights and resources, and requires the Texas Military Department to provide to the legislature on an annual report related to sexual assault prevention and response activities. Whereas Texas has the largest state military force in the country and now sets an example for the country by protecting its service members and delivering justice for victims of military sexual trauma with the implementation of SB 623. Be it resolved, the El Paso County Commissioner's Court does hereby encourage awareness of mi military sexual trauma by recognizing and advocating for service members who are victims of military sexual trauma and celebrating the bravery and strength of survivors. The El Paso County Commissioner's Court affirms El Paso County's commitment to reduce and ultimately eradicate military sexual trauma in our armed forces, as well as on our streets. We urge all residents to share our commitment during the month of December and every month following. In official recognition whereof, the commissioners of the court hereby affix their signatures this sixth day of December, 2021 in El Paso County, Texas. Second. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Well, Senator Blanco, welcome. What, what a great honor to have you here as a veteran and uh, a most appropriate person to be involved in this topic. Uh, thank you, Senator, for being with us. Thank you, Judge. Uh, appreciate it. It's great to be here with you all. And I want to thank Commissioner Olguin uh, for your leadership uh, in bringing forth uh, this important resolution. Um, and I also want to thank the, the entirety of the El Paso County Commissioner's Court. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's, this is so important, I think, uh, that we set the standard uh, for the country. Uh, the, as you all know, this applies to the Texas military forces. It doesn't apply to the federal forces, which I think is important, but Texas is leading the way I think, uh, because of this bill in uh, setting an example uh, that could be modeled by the federal government. Um, but, you know, I, I just truly appreciate your tribute uh, to the victims of military sexual assault and your recognition of uh, the important work that we've done uh, in the Texas legislature to prevent this type of harassment. As you all uh, recall last year the the tragic circumstances uh, surrounding uh, private first class Vanessa Guillen's uh, disappearance and untimely death uh, I think shed light on how uh, oftentimes the system fails to protect our heroes uh, on, on her her own base that she served a place where uh, Vanessa should have felt safest um, 
you know, she, she lived in fear. And it was reported that, you know, she had shared with family and friends that, that she was assaulted on base. Uh, but unfortunately, she was just too scared to report it. Um, and I think that Vanessa Guillen's story exemplifies the, the unacceptable uh, pervasiveness of sexual assault in the military. Um, and she's not alone. Um, so, I, I'm, you know, I was proud to have introduced and passed uh, Senate Bill 623, uh, known as uh, the Vanessa Guillen Act. We, we work with Vanessa Guillen's family um, and asked ask permission to, to name it, and they, they uh, allowed us to name the, the bill in her honor. And as Commissioner Olguin said, this bill provides victims of sexual assault in, in the Texas Armed Forces with, with greater resources and with uh, additional avenues for justice. And, and with the Vanessa Guillen Act, Texas is leading the way uh, by example in protecting our Texas military members from sexual assault and uh, ensuring swift justice uh, that, is, that is delivered for, for victims. So I'm, I'm grateful to, to all of you who advocate for members of our armed forces. I just uh, witnessed the, the uh, honoring of, uh, of uh, the veteran who uh, passed. And uh, I'm gonna continue to fight to ensure that, that our heroes get justice uh, that they deserved. And, and I just wanna once again thank you, uh, our El Paso County Commissioner's Court for this resolution for Honor even those who who serve our country and and for raising awareness about military sexual trauma. So thank you very much. Well, we, we thank you for this particular bill, but there's so many other things, uh, Senator, that you're behind and uh, with veterans and you know anything veterans and, and you're very supportive. But just in, in general to to the community, you know our military is so important and and we cannot have you know, our young uh, people that it's a great career, it's a great place, and, and we want to make sure that they feel that it's comfortable and safe to be there. And, and I know that what what took place, uh, really a lot of families thought about encouraging their, their children, especially their daughters, to, to be in the military. Uh, and that could be very detrimental to, to our safety and our, you know, from our country and our protection of our country. Uh, so this is something, it's a root cause situation, and the symptoms are greater of, of people not wanting to be uh, in, these, uh, in these situations. And so we thank you. Uh, we've got to do everything to, to create the kind of environment, as you said, you know, you would think that that's one of the safest places that they would ever be in. And when that didn't happen, it, it opened our eyes. So uh, uh, thank you for this. I think it's got some long-range um, impact if, if we don't uh, do something quickly about the, the safety of our, of our uh, military personnel. Thank you, Senator. Commissioner Olguin. Thank you, Judge. Um, thank you, Senator Blanco, for your leadership in this area. We know that we have a lot of work to do before we eradicate um, sexual assault, both in the military and outside of the military, but your efforts, your leadership uh, in bringing this issue to the forefront is going to make the difference. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I appreciate thank you, your Commissioner. leadership, uh, Commissioner Olguin, and, and, and bringing this resolution forward. You know, um, Texas provides, is the number one producer of women veterans. Um, and I think, especially in a community like El Paso, uh, that is very military friendly with Fort Bliss. Uh, I think uh, your leadership and in, in, in bringing forth this resolution uh, sends a message uh, to all those women uh, that are serving in Fort Bliss and, and women that are serving our Texas uh, National Guard that uh, we're here and we're safe and then Paso County uh, is here to recognize uh, this issue happens, um, but uh, couldn't have done it without your leadership, Commissioner Olguin, so we really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Judge. Go ahead, Jessica. Item 5D, approve and adopt a resolution supporting the endeavors of Six Guns and Whiskey in their efforts to produce a documentary film series, as well as their efforts to cultivate the film industry and talent in El Paso County, Texas. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, it's, it's really uh, my honor, and I was so glad uh, that we had the Commissioner uh, Stout that, that had uh, uh, Don Shapiro have, be in, in this uh, the same venue, and then I'm very thankful for that. So uh, I'll read this into the record. Whereas film is considered to be an important art form, a source of popular entertainment, and a powerful medium for educating citizens, the visual basis of film gives it a universal power of communication. And where Six Guns and Whiskey is producing a documentary film series of Western-themed dramatizations based on true stories which occurred during the Wild West days in El Paso County, and will also captivate audiences from all demographics by breaking the mold of traditional narrative documentaries. Whereas these exciting documentaries will focus on the lives of great and defiable personages and moments of late 1800s, and will cover a vast variety of struggles, valor, bravery, mystery, and crime. And whereas the docu-series portrays passionate stories accurately depicting and preserving the rich historical legacy of El Paso, Texas, and will assist in stimulating our local economy through job creation by hiring local talent and retailers during film productions, and whereas the overall mission of Six Guns and Whiskey LLC is to help create better incentives for the film industry in the Paso del Norte region. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Judge and Commissioner's Court that the County of El Paso supports the endeavors of Six Guns and Whiskey in producing a documentary film series, as well as their efforts to cultivate the film industry and talent in El Paso. Signed the sixth day of December, 2021. Commissioner Ogin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Well, thank you. you if, Joshua, if you want to start off, uh, you know, we're very, uh, most people realize that if you've lived here, that at one time the film industry was very popular and, and uh, we were depicted uh, sometimes uh, in, in good ways and maybe not such good ways, and, uh, but we were part of the industry. Uh, and there's so much uh, to be, you know, to talk about today as one more cluster of importance of, of our economy. And, uh, and, and Josh will make reference to some of the other, you know, some of the communities that maybe don't have everything that we have and all the resources we have and from the mountains to the people to all kinds of opportunities and other communities might be doing a little bit more than we are and uh, somehow uh, that makes me a little competitive and, and, and want to, I want to be part of that uh, industry as well. So, Josh, you want to go start? Well, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, com all the commissioners, the judge, for giving, having us, uh, giving us the honor to be here. It's a really big, huge honor for us to be here, uh, myself personally. Thank you so much. Um, just wanted to say that uh, this, this project that I'm... Sorry, can, can, you, can you tell us your name, please? Oh, I'm so, sorry. So my, name is my name is Joshua Ruiz. Thank you. I am uh, pro um, the producer and co-director for Six Guns and Whiskey a docu-series. And um, our, it's, it's, it's a, like I was saying, it's a huge honor to be here because this has always been, um, personally, my dream to do a film based here on El Paso, Texas. Nobody's ever done this. This is a first, the first time, the first attempt that anybody's ever put a project like this. And um, to, bring, to, bring, make, to bring this film here is to bring uh, tourist attraction from all over the world, not just for the El Paso County, but also for Europe. Europe, uh, this type of genre is really huge. It's a big deal. And um, I believe this, it can stimulate the economy um, just, just in this, with this project alone. I um, just wanted to say, I won't take too much time up here because I have other friends that are going to, that are part of the project here, they're going to speak as well. So uh, I just want to say that um, uh, Billy the Kid, um, Lincoln National Park, New Mexico. Um, white Herb represents Tombstone, Arizona. It's about time we represent our own. Um, Dallas Stoltenmeyer, uh, the stories that happened with him in, in, this, in this city of El Paso, and specifically downtown El Paso, um, El Paso Street. Uh, to talk about the stories there and the history, the rich history and the culture that took place here and to let everyone know to uh, send a message to everyone all over the world, especially Europe and our own community, that we can tell our stories. Why wait for Hollywood to tell our stories? 
Why should we wait? And that's, what, that's the thing where we're trying to tap into now is that we're going to tell our story. This is our story to tell. And I just wanted to play a video, uh, a short teaser film, uh, trailer. Um, Absolutely. Nice camera action, yeah. <laughs> and here's just, just a, a, a teaser trailer we're going to play. So. Thank you, Joshua. Go ahead. The people who I think would be impacted by this story are, of course, local El Pasoans, but I think historians who have tried for years to dig to the truth. Uh, there's more information available now. There's information that wasn't available when many books were written uh, that changed the whole storyline on The Four Dead in Five Seconds. And I think anybody interested in the truth, the real truth, is going to want to hear this story. See, Thank you. Um, it's all about the, the, the stories in El Paso and what we want to bring for our county. Um, and I want to. Cardinals, executive producer. Absolutely. Good morning. Thank you, Carlos. So I am the executive producer, so I'm going to give you some data. I'm the data guy, I'm the money guy. <laughs> uh, we cannot do this without money. And this is very important because this is a, a very important project that create a, a big impact on the economy here in El Paso. So in Albuquerque, uh, state of New Mexico, they pulled in $623 million in 2021, close to a billion. Uh, state officials say that about That's better. Yeah. <laughs> State officials say that about 9,000 residents work in the industry with an average annual wage of about $56,000. That's a lot of jobs that are being created. Again, this is another opportunity to push forward, create dialogue on the film industry. One of the interesting concepts of uh, the market that we're in is the Latino market. The Latino market represents $2.6 trillion of GDP. If we were uh, a country, it would be the eighth largest economy in the world. Bigger than Brazil, twice as, <laughs> twice as big as Mexico. We have uh, great stories here that we can produce. Uh, movies like Eddie Guerrero, uh, 1949 Bowie Bears. How many people know that the Bowie Bears won a state championship in 1949? All Mexican-American. So again, this is an opportunity for us to create a dialogue, to create incentives for, for other filmmakers to create jobs and create an econ economic impact. So thank you very much for, for your support, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you both. And these are two young men. I got the opportunity to be at uh, one of their first fundraisers, and uh, we, I made a commitment. One of them, I, I got uh, our, our own uh, economic director, uh, Michael Hernandez. Uh, they're going to be meeting with each other because I think we haven't looked at this possibility of how it ties into tourism, how it ties to the economy, the job creations, uh, schools that will be developed because we, you'll, you'll need more actors. And so it's a lot of, lot of different dimensions. And uh, one of the commitments I made is that if you, if you see what they're trying to accomplish, if they fail, it's only because we didn't support them. It's not going to be because they don't have the right people, the right uh, producers, the right, uh, you know, they're amazing individuals, but we have to support them. And, and this is an opportunity for us 
Uh, we're trying to create a situation in San Elisario, and the, the, these uh, stories lend themselves to this cultural, this areas of, of opportunity that, that we've seen others that maximize it and optimize it so much greater, and uh, we can't let this uh, go by. So I, I do, you know, want to do everything possible to support them and, and make sure that they're they're successful. I don't know, is, is Leon here as well? That I'd like, I'd, I'd love to hear hear from. Thank Leon. you once again. Thank you, Leon. Go ahead. <laughs> My name is Leon Baker. I'm the director. Uh, I moved here to El Paso 23 years ago with the United States Border Patrol, recently retired. And a lot of my friends asked me, are you going to leave El Paso and go somewhere else? I was like, no, this place is awesome. You know, when I first got here, you'd see a lot of beer bottles and stuff like that on the street corners. It was dusty, it was dirty. Uh, this place is cleaned up, it's looking really good. Um, I'm also the owner of El Paso Ghost Tours. So to make my tour better, I would have to study history. I'd have to find out the truth behind some of the stories that uh, my predecessors were, were, were telling people. And so the more I dug, the more it revealed that El Paso and the entire region here has more history than uh, Tombstone, than Dodge City, than like a lot of these places that are famous from the comic books and from uh, TV, from the movies. El Paso has more. I mean, it goes way back, you know, to the late 1500s, you know, uh, even further back if you consider the, uh, the Mogollon people and uh, uh, the local uh, Native American tribes. There's just so much. And we have so much to choose from when it comes to doing documentaries. It's a no-brainer. Um, I just don't know why Hollywood never picked up on it. And we've all heard of Billy the Kid. We've all heard of Jesse James, Wyatt Earp, et cetera. Uh, very few people have heard of Dallas Stoudemire. Very few people have heard of uh, uh, some of these other names that, that are just El Paso. Um, there's just so many. And so, like I said, it's a no-brainer. I mean, we just pick up on it, and, and we create these names. We put them out there. And then Billy the Kid, his name will be right next to uh, Johnny Hale, um, all these other people that El Pasoans, very few El Pasoans even know about. When I do my tour, uh, I get thousands of people every year to go on the tour. Uh, maybe one in a hundred actually knows anything about what I'm teaching them on these, on these history tours. Very few people actually understand. I ask them sometimes, anybody ever heard these stories? No. And, and uh, very <laughs> what got me motivated actually was one of my tours, I was kind of regurgitating the old stories and uh, one of my guests started correcting me. That motivated me to learn more and better, so I understood and I could teach other people the right stories. And that's digging into the four dead in five seconds, I found out there's probably 10 different versions, you know, which one's right. And digging deeper and deeper, I'm finding that, uh, and I uncover information all the time, uh, that those stories were not correct, that Dallas Stoudemire actually suffered from PTSD. And he served from the age of 15 in the Civil War. And he had been blown up, he'd been shot, he carried two bullets in his body till the day he died, which he collected another one. Um, and it goes to explain why he was doing what he was doing, what was kind of going through his head, and that's kind of where we're going with it. Like, um, I think we plan on, on focusing a little bit on the PTSD aspect also. So it kind of incorporates the, the veteran aspect of it also, because even though it was a civil war, even though he was on the, the Confederate side, he's still considered a veteran. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very important to get our story out there. And I hope it, it uh, attracts the attention of some of the bigger film industry people uh, to tap into our market that, that we want to create here, that we want to expand. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Leon, and th thank you. And uh, you know, this is, uh, it's one series, but uh, let's not lose sight that this, the reason for that is to create the impetus of, of the excitement of this. Um, I think we're stuck with, you know, that Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burden lived at the uh, plaza. I think we're sort of stuck there. <laughs> and we have to now realize that there's much more that needs to happen uh, than looking back and, and not having anything right now uh, to do this. So we, we, we thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner 
I just want to make, make, make a few comments real quick. Thank you all for being here. And, and uh, you know, I, I've also had the opportunity to, to sit down with, uh, with Carlos and, and chat about some of these things. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it I think, uh, dovetails perfectly into, you know, one of my policy priorities and one that has become a you know, policy of the county, which is heritage tourism and, and really trying to foment uh, tourism, you know, bringing people here to, to El Paso uh, by telling our story and what our heritage is. And, and this is part of it, right? And so, so I thank you very much for, for, you know, taking this endeavor and, and doing this, and I, and I, um, you know, I want to take this opportunity to uh, to make a shameless plug. Well, maybe people will think it's shameless, but um, for for a proposal that I've brought forward uh, in the past, which is to use uh, some of our American Rescue Plan Act dollars, we we're, the county is getting 164 million dollars from the federal government, um, as well as other county funds to help foment uh, the arts in our community. Um, we've heard from so many artists and creatives that, um, you know, they were left out of much of the past opportunities to receive stimulus, and they've been struggling financially uh, over the past two years. You all may be in, the, in that boat as well, um, uh, because you know that you know they, they've been struggling because they've uh, may not have an incorporated business or, or sole proprietorships, whatever it may be. Um, and I think that the, uh, the resolutions today, um, you know, discussing Mr. Shapiro and, and Valentin Sandoval's work to, to help create more uh, opportunities for creatives, and this resolution, uh, as well as even the, the, the program that Lisa Wise put together uh, to encourage arts in the school, and uh, I think they all remind us of how important the arts are and how important it is for us as the Commissioner's Court to not forget about all of the amazing benefits that the arts provide to individuals, whether it's creating jobs, bringing in tourism, you know, creating economic opportunities for folks in our community, or providing things like healing for folks that are going through difficult times or folks that suffer from mental illness. Um, the arts are so, so necessary, in my opinion. And I think that we should take this unprecedented opportunity to show the creative community, as well as the community as a whole, that we recognize this. And, you know, doing these resolutions, I think, is a great way to talk about how we think the arts are important. But uh, as we all know, they're, they're honorary recognitions, and, and they do help. They're wonderful. But I don't think they're enough. Um, I want to urge the court to uh, not, just, not just give lip service to uh, supporting these initiatives, but rather put our money where our mouth is and, uh, and really create some meaningful opportunities for folks by setting aside some of that ARPA funding. Uh, this is exactly where that phrase can be applied, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, and, and so that said, I, I, I hope that in the future when we have discussions about our ARPA funding uh, and other county funding that we remember this day and these resolutions and the work that you all are doing uh, and that we make a commitment not to just recognize what others are doing, but we commit to the work as well and partner with them to, to create more art and more opportunities for folks like you all. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Commissioner. That's uh, very important, it, uh, a great challenge, and uh, we will look into every opportunity to, to create the, uh, the arts and, and you know, your, your initiative. Uh, so we thank you uh, for being here today. I don't know if you had anyone else that would like to speak. Well, oh, yes, go ahead. Good morning, Your Honor, Commissioners. Good Keith morning. Weldon. To keep my list of jobs in this project down, I'm the tech advisor, uh, co-writer, and uh, chief bottle washer. <laughs> I was brought on this thing at, uh, as a tech advisor originally. I saw the enthusiasm these guys had and the fact that they want to do it right. And for those of you who remember me, well, you know how it is. It's got to be done. If it's got to get done. It's got to be done right. And I jumped on with both feet, and uh, I don't think I've talked, cut, took a breath since because it's been a great ride. Uh, I've got a lot of faith in this project. Uh, a lot of sweat and, and uh, swearing involved, too. <laughs> but there's so many stores we got in El Paso, F over 500 years of history that have barely been touched. Later on down the line, if we can get the money where I can afford to buy the costume, and I'd love to do the first Thanksgiving here. 
You know, they always get talked about, and how the heck since Sheldon Hall passed away, it doesn't even get uh, re referred to much anymore. And i got to thank you, Commissioner Ogin, because basically most of our exterior shots are being done down at your, your uh, deck of the woods. And a lot, thank you for your support, too, Your Honor. Thank you. And indirectly, thank you as well, Commissioner Stout. I mean, I know you've been a, a big uh, supporter of the uh, heritage tourism since you took office, and it all helps. So thank you much again. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Okay, we're, we're done. We want to thank all of you, and uh, like I said, you know, let's get on that. Uh, you know, behind this situation, and uh, great things are going to be able to happen. It's a new industry for us that, uh, as you said, so many stories. Uh, this community, we're all storytellers. I mean, have you ever been anywhere? Nobody tells as many stories. They just don't, they're not highlighted, and they're not, they don't get to be seen outside of El Paso. And so we're looking forward to putting us on the map, and uh, we're here to support uh, every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, item number six is public comment. At this time, we do not have any members signed up for public comment. We will take no action for item number six. Uh, Betsy, any preference on the order or anything that you have anyone? And no, sir, if you'd like to take the purchasing items because they're here, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, sure. Otherwise, uh, we would recommend regular order. Okay, I, I think as uh, commissioner's gone, but I think the um, the purchasing would be good for us to okay. take on. Purchasing. Okay. Item number 15, purchasing. Approve the purchase of MDR and POD data centers equipment maintenance and support locations with countywide impact through Information Technology Department using contract DIR TSO 4160 awarded to Hewitt Packard Enterprise Company of Roseville, California in the annual amount of $198,716.78, one year with two one-year renewable options to include pricing index fluctuations. Purchasing approved on November 23, 2021. Funding is available in general fund ITD maintenance repair hardware. Mr. Lopez. For the record, Jose Lopez, Assistant Purchasing Agent. I will be introducing you and deferring to Excellent. the new purchasing agent for the County of El Paso, Karen Davidson. She's a great asset, and she's wise to me already, so we're in trouble. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> she'll be taking this one over. Well, once again, thank you, uh, Mr. Lopez, for everything you've done and being the interim, as, as you've done in other occasions. and. Uh, this, Karen, this will be your debut, so thank you for, for being here. We, we welcome you and welcome you into our, our county family, so thank you for being here today. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm delighted to be part of this team, and yes, a great thank you to Joe Lopez. He's dedicated decades of service to this department, and he's leaving me with a great team to take on. So this morning, I am bringing item number 15 to you for your, uh, the court's approval for the purchase of the MDR POD data center equipment. This is a countywide impact. It is for our information technology department. Um, it is with Hewlett Packard. We're purchasing this off of a state of Texas DIR contract, TSO 4160. And it, it will be for three years, the first initial year at 198, 716, 78, and two additional one year renewal options with the price fluctuation. Thank you. Move to approve. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon is absent. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Aye. Item number 16, approve award of bid 21-031 traffic control products for the County of El Paso to Osborne Associates, Inc. of Logan, Ohio, Pathmark Traffic Equipment, LLC of San Marcos, Texas, 
per line item as indicated in the tabulation. Purchasing approved on November 23, 2021. Funds are available in SR, Road and Bridge Maintenance, Repair, Road Signs. Good morning again, Karen Davidson, purchasing agent for the County of El Paso. This was a competitive bid, bid number 21-031 for our traffic control products. We are um, requesting the award to two separate vendors based on line items, best quality um, and best value, and then the pricing. So we are asking for the first one to be awarded to Asborn Associates in Ohio and Pathmark Tra Traffic Equipment. And um, this was done and approved through the Purchasing Review Board as well. Move to approve. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Item number 17. Approve and authorize the purchasing agent to award RFP 21-029 parking lot management services for the County of El Paso Overland MDR parking lot to Parking Systems of America LP of Dallas, Texas. Purchasing approved on November 23, 2021. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Commissioners. Again, Karen Davidson, Purchasing Agent. We did an RFP for these services, and we are asking for your approval to authorize me to award it to um, the, um, the MDR parking lot to the Parking Systems of America. And this is, has no financial impact to the county. It is, uh, derives re revenue. Thank you. Move to approve. Second. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Item number 18, approve and authorize the purchasing agent to award RFP 21-030 impact assessment case management software for juvenile probation department to Noble Software Group LLC of Redding, California. Purchasing approved on November 23, 2021. Funds are available in General Fund, JPD, Contract Services General. Again, com Judge and Commissioners Karen Davidson, Purchasing Agent. We are requesting your authorization to approve and uh, the RFP 21-032 for PAC assessment case management software for the JPD. This is very specialized software. We did have an extensive outreach and we are bringing back this one noble um, software group as the one that meets the specifications. We're asking for your approval for this award of this contract. Move to approve. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number 19. Approve purchase and install police equipment into three patrol vehicles and one K-9 unit using Region 19 Contract 17-7259 awarded to Alamo Auto Supply of El Paso, Texas in the amount of $109,000. $109, thousand five hundred fifty dollars and five cents purchasing approved on november 24 2021 funding is available in cocp 3001 replace 21 and cp replace 21 so patrol vehicles judge and commissioners we are asking for your approval um, to Alamo Auto Supply. This is through a cooperative, Region 19, a local cooperative here, and Alamo Auto Supplies puts in those to the specifications that we need for these three um, patrol vehicles and one canine unit. Move to approve. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Item number 20, approve the purchase of FY 2022 vehicles for the County of El Paso using Goodbye Cooperative Contract 21-8F000 awarded to Silsby Fort Inc. of Silsby, Texas in the amount of $1,706,454.44. Purchasing approved on November 23, 2021. 
Funding is available in COCP 3001 Replace 22, CP Replace 22 Fleet Vehicles, CIT Grant Award, and SG GOOGCIT 22 Cap Outlays, and GF Animal Welfare Cap Out Vehicles. Judge and Commissioners, Karen Davidson, Purchasing Agent. We are asking to award the replacement of uh, 2022 20, vehicles to the um, cooperative contract, Goodbye Cooperative, and this is a CIP approved project, and it will be the $1.7 million for a multiple amount of vehicles. Move to approve. Second. Commissioner Ogin. Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Judge. Karen, Joe, and uh, just as a sideline, we're uh, really encouraging, you know, local businesses. So whatever you could do to encourage our local businesses to be part of the process, we would be very appreciative of that. Thank you, sir. We'll take that under your advice. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Commissioner Hopton Staple, Fleet Operations Director. I just want to put a little bit of context to what was just uh, briefed to you. Uh, it's a total of 53 vehicles. Uh, 36 is funded through CIP, our annual uh, ongoing replacements. Uh, 10 of those vehicles are through the ARPA funding. Those are those 10 patrol vehicles you approved for the Sheriff's Office a few weeks ago. Four is uh, CIT, the Crisis Intervention Team. And three is for the animal welfare for the three new officers that you approved that will start, uh, I want to say, March, April of next year. Well, thank you. Yeah. And as far as local, uh, again, we, prior to any bid, we always reach out to the local vendors. Thank you. And uh, none of them were able to meet this requirement, uh, uh, but we did reach out to them first. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and sir, thank you for everything that you do. We're, thank we're you. very appreciative of your work. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Judge, would, you, would like you like to go to the items pulled from consent? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, item 4D, approve and authorize the County Elections Department to use $60,000 from the Redistricting Advisory Commission Fund account to prepare present and provide publication notice of county election precinct boundary changes pursuant to the Texas Election Code. Funding is available in general fund, G-admin, operations, contingencies. Commissioner Stout. Um, thanks, Judge. Um, I, I pulled the item um, uh, because, you know, I, I wanted to uh, I guess begin or re up or re up or the the discussion about using the redistricting commission to um, assist the county in evaluating the precinct lines for the next statutorily required um, adjustments. Um, I think I think that it's important to note that the um, that the state requires that each uh, commissioner's court um, shall determine compliance with rules regarding the precinct lines. Um, in March or April, I think of every every odd numbered year, if if I'm not mistaken, and may do so in even numbered years as well. So, um, it, the code I think the code also allows for as few as a hundred uh, and as many as five thousand votes um, voters of, among the other provisions. Uh, so, uh, and I think that's in in, in chapter forty two uh, uh, of the election code, and so. Um, I wanted to to just bring that up and, and, and also see if there's a way that we can get a report on the precincts um, following this, this March primary, Ms. Weiss, uh, so that we, we can build upon the community for engagement uh, and, and interest generated by um, the, the, com the creation of the commission and, and the work that it's done and to see if any adjustments are, are needed um, uh, or desired prior to the November general. So. Um, I'm not sure if you have any further insight or, or, if, or if Betsy has anything that she'd like, she'd like to add. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, Judge Commissioners. Lisa Weisel, El Paso County Elections Administrator. So a couple things that you touched um, on, Commissioner, is the, um, 
obviously the redistricting that we're still working on. Um, we're hoping to bring those maps to the special meeting on the 16th, um, and we're on we're on task to do that. So, um, I, first of all, I, our staff has been working, you know, tirelessly sure. to do what we normally would do in six months, in six weeks, <clears throat> to meet the deadline. Um, as far as having a report after the uh, March primary. Yes, we will have a mar we will have a report. However, I believe there is a, c a part in the code that talks about switching precincts between a primary and general. I am I don't believe we'd be able to do that. I'd have to double check, um, but I think that once the primary has happened, you're not able to switch between a primary and general. Okay. However, in 2023, we will revisit the lines again, like you said, every two years. Um, and, and we're happy to have community feedback on that. I just, I, I think the, the most important thing to understand is that there's not a lot of discretion on those lines. So basically what we've done so far is we'll take the lines that the state submitted and we go layer by layer, right? So we'll start with uh, the two congressional districts, then we did state senate, which is obviously simple because it's one, then we did all the house, um, then we'll go and do the State Board of Education, um, and then we'll take the county lines. And once you layer those one on top of the other, on top of the other, and you make sure that you don't have more than 5,000, and you make sure that you're not running incorporated with unincorporated, and you make sure that you don't have um, less than 100 and things like that, um, we don't have a lot of discretion on how to draw those lines, right? Because they're basically drawn for us. <clears throat> So I have no problem with that. I just, there's not a lot of, there may be eight to 10 precincts that could have the option of, hey, maybe you wanna draw this street back on this block and, and make this one election precinct. But a lot of it is controlled by what we are already mandated by law to, to meet. So uh, I have no issue with that. But again, it's not this kind of like, come back to the table, start over. Yeah. It's very, yeah very limited um so you know we haven't made we haven't made a lot of decisions as far as well what do we think should this precinct go should this street go into this precinct it, it, a lot of them are already that has to go into that precinct in order to comply with law so and you'll see those like i said um on the 16th for approval um but i'm happy to i'm happy to have any type of to input when we revisit in two years uh, in 2023 and if I could just, um, just step in really quickly. So I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Ms. Weiss's office when we've had to do this um, as my role in Democratic Party chair a couple of years ago. And it is very, when it gets down to the precinct level, like Ms. Weiss said, it, a lot of it is already very predetermined. We didn't, we didn't have to make a lot of the decisions that, for example, the commission um, made when they were looking at the commissioner's precincts and the JP precincts because by this point it's just so data driven that uh, there really isn't very much discretion. So I am all in favor of our redistricting commission trying, they did such a wonderful job trying to get them as involved in, in everything that we possibly can from here on out. Uh, but with this particular issue, it's really, there's just not any room really for, for you know there's it's all pretty much been predetermined unfortunately well, there may be a little bit and, and, I, and i understand that i mean if we can't switch and and you know that's mm -hmm. fine um but like you said we had such a great level of community engagement through the committee i just think it would be great to keep the momentum going and and part of that ongoing process you know is could be this just you know i think it just gets pe those people who are who are interested beyond just the uh party affiliated folks and and the elections professionals um you know more into the process right and so i mean we can we can uh revisit in 2022 um i'm just i'm just suggest suggesting that that there are members of the community who may want to who may want to participate in 2022 right so um i, I know that's not going to be a grand rewrite of anything but i think it just helps to to, to keep the community engaged and, and the thing if i could just say that even the, the good part about it is even if let's say there's let's say there's four or five precincts or six precincts at least um we can also refresh them on on using gis um, the software because assuming that you know they'll continue to do updates and and however the, that commission operates for the the county that's a benefit in my opinion is that not maybe starting all over with um 
you know, with getting them updated on that, that the GIS software we use updates several times a year. So I think that's another benefit of that. And it would be something, in my opinion, where we would say, look, by law, this is the lines for the 215 precincts. There's six that there's some discretion, and they could look at those those six. It's just it's it's going to be a very small number. Sure. So, um, I but that. I have no problem with that. I just I I don't want them to think that it's oh we can come in and start doing that because by law there's just not there's just not a lot of options. Yeah. No, I I understand that. I, I, and, I, and I appreciate so appreciate that. So. Um, uh, there was a, one other question. I don't know if I should ask it on this item or the other item. I think it's item 11 that we talk about, or, or 10, the, the precinct boundary lines. But um, I was wondering, what is the process for um, notifying people that their precinct changed? I know that, I mean, obviously, you, you, it'll probably, they'll see it when you send out the new voter, voter cards, right, that, that tells them where they are. But are we doing something like proactive to, you know, make note of that, you know, because people will get those cards and then they'll be like, you know, oh, okay, my card's here, but I don't know if they're actually going to know to look for any changes, right? So, so by law, obviously every other year we do the precinct, the, the cards. Um, that deadline has been extended by the state to January 12th. It's normally like December 12th. Obviously counties aren't able I to do that. I think this would go, just really quickly, sorry, Lisa, just started, this would probably go to the other item. If we want to read that in, we okay. can go ahead and read that in, which is... is that okay, Judge? Yeah. Item 10. Item? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. Item number 10, receive an update from county administration and the county attorney's office regarding new commissioner and justice of the precinct uh, pre boundaries and representation, which will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Opinion number 21-1436. Okay, so a couple a couple things on that on that item is specific to the JPs and the county commissioners precincts. Obviously, the, what we draw are the election precincts. Everyone will get that new card. Um, what we've done in the past when we changed precincts where we added, you know, we went from 192 to 208, was we we basically kind of just did a, an outreach where we we got on social media, we got on the website, watch for your new blue colored. Um, I can't remember if it's gold or orange this year. But either way, here's what the color is going to be. Um, your precinct may have changed. It's not, it's not as important because we are at vote centers. So in the way that your precinct still is going to determine what's on, what's on your ballot, but it's not going to stop you from voting at any location. Are, right. right. So it's a little different than what it was like in 2018 sure. and 2019. Um, and that's normally what we've done. When we when we know we're going to send these out, we send out a press release, keep an eye out for this colored card. You, However, you don't need to bring it to vote. That's something we always like to put in there. Um, but that's really what we have planned. We Just a kind of a social media blitz, a, a, a press blitz. Um, and that's normally what we do. I don't know, you know, I don't know what else we would do sending so many, you know, sending 500,000 registered voters a letter to let them know that another letter is going to come. I don't know if that's the best, the most effective way, the most efficient way to do it. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, and I was just wondering because you know, I, I um, you know, I'll, I think all of our, that I, I think that's that that's fine for for the individual pro, like the voting precincts, because as you said, the vote centers <clears throat> and they can go vote anywhere, and so that's not going to be a huge issue. But, um, you know, I worry if it's if it's going to be if it's going to affect people, for example. You know, I, I I picked up some area that's in, in precinct two that that was in Commissioner Leon's area, right? And so, if people aren't aware that um, Commissioner Leon is no longer their elected official and they don't see his name on the on the ballot, they get blindsided by that. They may undervote or they may you know be like, hey, what's going on here, and, and may not participate. I don't know, you know, and and so because there's confusion as to um, who they're you know, who, who their elected official is now. Right, and that may be a county admin um, discussion, so I would defer to them on that. Um, but if, if there's something that, you know, the court decides they want us to do, us to promote, whether in um, conjunction with them or on our own, I'm, we're happy to do that. Yeah, and I mean, obviously when we're out campaigning, we have to let people know that, but I, I don't necessarily think that that's, I mean, first of all, we don't talk to everybody, and, and, and second of all, um, you know, I think that the county should 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 play a role in, in advising people 
the, the changes, right? And, so, and I'm sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'm yeah, sorry. Um, go ahead. So um, what I'm hearing, and I, I think would be informative to the public, would be for us to put out a new precinct map with information about uh, your precinct may have changed. Please refer to this map. And uh, so the public, wherever they are, could look and see which precinct they're in. And is that something that we could send out, like with the voting cards when, when we send them out? Or how would that work? No. I mean, normally that would be separated. Yeah. Okay. Um, it would be something that we would send out as an informational s mailer. Okay. Yeah, it would be something that, and, and normally like what we would do when we moved precincts, like like I said a couple years ago when we went from 191 to 208, we, we only sent those to people who, who's had changed. So it wasn't a mass, you know, we're almost going to be at a half a million registered voters this year. So um, it was these eight precincts, just to let them know. So it may be something where if you guys ha want to just send it to the ones that have changed, that might be something that's obviously... Um, yeah, you don't have to send it to everybody, right? But just Uses less resources. Um, yeah. But the certificate can't be mailed with anything else. That's okay. in statute. It's gotcha. covered by Chapter 19 funds. Um, and we're not allowed to... It's a card, and that's Understood. just how it goes. Yeah. I mean, and, and for legal, is that, is that something that the county can use resources to do? Yeah, that, that's a public purpose there. You're informing them of the new, of the new, uh, of the new lines, absolutely. I, yes, but it's absolutely critical that you do keep that separate, especially with the new rules that we have in place now um, that were just passed as well. You want to keep that very separate, but it would be a, a county-based initiative in terms yeah, of But it would the support, public. you know, just targeting the people that, that have, are going to be affected, to, that they know. I mean, I... We, we try so hard to get people to go vote, and if there's any confusion, that could limit the voting. But uh, so I think targeting those that are going to, you know, whether uh, Commissioner Leon had gained them or, you know, they're now with someone else, I think it's very important that they that they acknowledge that change. And, and we've known how difficult it is when you do it through, uh, you know, through you know, PSAs or by, you know, stations. It, 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 we're not reaching the number of people that we should. So I think we should target, and if you could give us a budget on that and, and get that and we have, quickly. Yes, sir. And we have, if you, so if you'll clarify, do you want us to send it to all registered voters or only to those who are impacted by the change? But I'm I think imagining, only those impacted by the change would yeah. be okay. the important. Because I'm imagining it would say, here's the map, here's who you're represented by, here's their contact information for their office, yeah. here's their, you know, email addresses, things of that nature. Yeah, just say there's been a change, <clears throat> right? This is the new map. There's been a change. You're no longer represented by the person you were before. You're, you're, you're now in this, in, this, uh, in this precinct. Right. And, and uh, so... And the additional information will be sent from the elections right. office. And then um, we do have plenty of funds in the redistricting line items Good. To, to cover that cost. But we can put something together, share it with you all for feedback, and then um, uh, get a quote on a... Especially um, before, as, as early as possible before the... Another yes. project for you, Ramon. <laughs> and the other thing that I, I just want to add on to that, that we could include in that letter, even though we want to keep the funding separate and things like that, once we're done with the lines and we come and we uh, present on the 16th and, and you approve them and they go into effect on the 1st and we then move everybody from, because there's the line drawing and then there's actually moving the registered voters to their new precincts in the system. And that's why the extension was given by the state till January 12th. Once that's done, voters can use our voter lookup and you go in, you put the address, or you put your view at VUID, however you want to go in, and it'll tell you every elected official that'll be on your ballot. And that right. will be updated, Excellent. obviously, after we, we get everybody moved in VMAX. So that's something we can put on there, too, to check Great. the voter uh, lookup on our website um, and, and encourage people to go to that. Yeah. If you could bring that up, Betsy, sooner, better than later. Ramon, yes. were you going to comment or anything? Or? No? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that y'all are willing to do that because I think it's important to let people know. So we read in two items. So you still have item D from the consent that does require the court's action, which is to yeah, approve. Yeah, I'm to approve item, item okay. D. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And we've already read in item 10 into the record. So you can go ahead and proceed, Mr. Bracamontes. Judge Commissioners, good morning. Ramon Bracamontes from County Administration. And with, with me on, uh, should be Anna Schumacher from the County Attorney's Office. We just wanted to put this public because after, uh, if approved, we need to notify all the J JPs and the constables too. But there has been some discussion as to when the new districts, the new precincts go into effect, when the new, uh, for the JPs, constables, and for the commissioner's court. So we went out and got a formal uh, county attorney opinion. And as of January 1, the new precinct boundaries go into effect for everybody. And the reason they do that is because none of the commissioners and none of the JPs or constables were moved out of their precinct. So, for example, Commissioner uh, Leon's Precinct 1, his boundaries changed, but him and his uh, voting precinct stay the same. So he now represents, on January 1, the new Commissioner 1 Precinct boundary lines. And Commissioner Holguin represents the new lines on Precinct 3. Same thing for Commissioner Stout. And the JPs also, while they, because they were left intact, in, they were moved to run against in another district, the new boundary lines t take into effect January 1st. Excellent. Uh, I don't know if Anna wants to add anything to this. Go ahead, Anna. Thank you. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. I think that uh, Ramon covered it really well. Um, but just to add a few things, um, I was grateful that Commissioner Olguin brought this up um, because I think it lends itself um, for there to be confusion. But essentially, the legislative history on this is that in the event someone was moved, right, they didn't want people to basically be forced out of office. And so there were provisions put in place that would allow people to continue representation, their representation through the end of their term if they had been moved out. But as Ramon said, that's not the case here. Um, so as the order sets forth, um, you know, that we passed and approved earlier this year, the changes would take effect January 1st for everyone. Thank you, Anna. Always Thank a you. pleasure to have you. Thank you for all your commitment to, to these topics. Thank you. No action Thank you. required on this, I think. Okay. Thank you. No action. Thank you. Um, back to the item on consent, item 4E. Pursuant to Texas Local Government Code, section 81.032, approve and authorize the acceptance of monetary donations for site activities and purposing planning for the properties located at, at 6345, 6315, and 6295 Alameda for the remainder of 2021 and 2022. Commissioner Stone. Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Judge, again. Um, I just wanted to, to, to pull the, the item to... To thank uh, our staff and the and and the judge and his his staff and uh, and everybody else for the support for for you know for this to very meaningfully engage the community um, in the process of determining you know a new life for this for this property. I think it's a very unique project, and you know of course we have those constraints that we're always talking about that Chapter 59 gives us, but um, we also want the community to help us think creatively. And, and, and add this to the list of community assets, just like Ascara at the park in, in, that's in the area. Uh, I want to thank Joel Bishop, especially, uh, for leading the project. It's, I think it's been all he's been eating, breathing, and sleeping, <laughs> dreaming <Yeah>. about <laughs> all uh, the, the, last, the last number of, of, of weeks. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people at the county have, have also pitched in, the entire county family has pitched in to make it happen from Veronica Myers at the parks to to uh, Laura, Dr. Laura Gallegos in, in our um, uh, communications department, Eric Eric Hernandez at facilities, uh, Renee Garcia, who's who's been on site a number of times, and of course the the leaders at the neighborhood associations, um, the um, the Corbin Sombrano and San Juan Washington Delta and Valverde neighborhood associations, and of course uh, Marathon uh, Oil for the very generous contribution donation that they provided uh, which is which which is this agenda item so I just wanted to, to, to thank everybody and I'll move to approve no second Commissioner Olguin aye Commissioner Leon aye Commissioner Stout aye Judge Samaniego aye motion carries I just want to add to Commissioner Stout um, it's being done the way it should be done you know from community involvement uh, from the very beginning, uh, participation. Uh, we've always uh, wanted that to happen. I think we've had, 
it's our chance because we're we're holding on to the initiative is is very much a county initiative and uh, getting everybody involved and uh, Commissioner Stout and everything that that he's doing to to support this uh, it, it's just been a a great initiative Joel uh, you know can't say enough you, you've been at this as if you don't have anything else to do right it's the only thing that you've got <laughs> I wish but uh, thank you for for giving it so much attention it is going to be a great initiative thank you I also I just one thing I, one more thing I forgot was uh, the um, the the work that that our counterparts at the city uh, representative Cassandra Hernandez and, and Bettina in her office, you know, you, you get on those calls, and it, you know, Bettina's there also helping to run the show. So she, they've been they've been great partners in this in this program. I may absolutely, uh, judge commissioners. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for the, for your support in this, and uh, Joel Bishop with County Admin. Um, thank you, Commissioner Stout, for for bringing that up. The uh, representative Hernandez has has really done a lot as have your offices and, and to help with this. And we've had so many from the community pitch in, um, even uh, d donations from all over, you know, the, the neighborhood associations are getting donations. The, many of the banners were donated. Um, the Paso del Norte Health Foundation and others, uh, other nonprofits are going to be there and help. So it's been really neat to see everyone coming together on this project, and I, I wanted to thank you for, for recognizing that and, that and also take the opportunity to thank our partners in the community for their help with this. And I think our biggest challenge at this point is gonna be the weather, but it may be a, it may be a white, uh, white, white event, <laughs> on, uh, snow, a snowy event on, on Saturday. So um, it looks like it's gonna be cold, but I think we're gonna have tents and there'll be hot chocolate and food, hot, warm, hot food, that kind of thing out there as well. It'll all be free to the community for coming in. The goal is to get as many surveys filled out as we can um, uh, and really engage the public in that and to inform the public as well. We'll have a nice uh, display set up so they can look at that and, and learn more about the history of the site and, what, and, and the potential future of the site. So thank, thank you again. Thank you, Joel. Jessica? Hey, item number have, nine. I'm sorry, Betsy, you, you had one item that... Yes, Judge. I was going to ask if it would be possible. I know we have um, Judge Chu on the line, and I was going to ask if it would be possible. She wanted to comment on one of the items. It is item number 12. <clears throat> so if we if it'd be possible to go to item number 12 before you break for lunch? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Go ahead and read that one in, item 12. Yes, item number 12. A strategic plan goal item, discuss and take appropriate action to increase county minimum wage to $13 an hour without compressing wages by authorizing an across-the-board wage adjustment for eligible county employees for FY22 pursuant to strategic plan goal 7, objective 7.4, move wage scales to higher minimum wages. Thank you. Judge Chu, you... Thank you for being here with us. We welcome you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, good morning. Good morning Judge. Good morning, Commissioners. Linda Chu, local administrative judge. Um, I would have preferred to be uh, with you in person instead of uh, video, but uh, I am teaching uh, this week at the College for New Judges in Austin. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to attend virtually. Uh, the teams and uh, Zoom, the medium, mediums for our new world. Um, today I'm here to speak in support of this wage adjustment. Uh, this wage adjustment is a long time coming. The, pandem the pandemic did a number of things, but one of the most important was to shine a light, a glaring spotlight indeed, on salaries. Uh, we have asked over the years much, much from our county community. In 2008, you will remember that we asked them to hold off while we worked our way through a recession. In 2020, we asked even more of them. Uh, we asked them to take on enormous challenges for which there was no guidebook. We asked them to accept new conditions. We asked them to navigate 
a workplace that changed completely, completely. And you know what? They all did it. They accepted the challenge. They met the challenge. And this county community can be very proud of what we accomplished and what we continue to accomplish. It is the folks who are the boots on the ground who have really dealt with the most difficulties and hardships in this new world, in this new normalcy. They showed each of us what courage is. They showed each of us what determination is and what grace looks like. And those folks, those folks who are the, boot on, the boots on the ground, made all of us, elected officials and department heads, appointed officials, look good. In fact, they made us look great, and they continue to do so. I understand that these kinds of decisions are very difficult. I am aware of the landscape that is out there now. I'm aware of the environment that each that face each of you, of us. But there are times when we must walk the talk. We must make difficult decisions as long as they are the right decision and made with moral courage to do what is right, then I think we can be proud. I urge you to approve this wage adjustment because no one deserves our support more than the folks around you, the folks who are behind you, taking care of you, the folks surrounding you who do so much to make each of us look good. I think we owe them at least this. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Chu. You're uh, such a trusting voice in our community and have done so much. So you have a great vantage point of the things that have happened and the work that people have done. So we really thank you for uh, giving us that additional view of, of what we're going to vote for. So we want to thank you for that. And I think we have, uh, yes, thank Commissioner you. Stout. Good. Uh, sorry, Judge Chu, were you going to add something else? I, I saw you. No, oh, thank okay. you. It was, it's been my honor, actually. Great. Um, uh, do, did we have a presentation that we wanted to go we for? We do, but okay. we also have another have um, speaker who okay, would like to go. Well. Yeah, our, then, our very okay. own I'll wait. Joanne I'll wait. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Um, good morning, Judge and Commissioners. I'm uh, Joanne Bernal, County Attorney, wearing my public official hat and not my I'm your lawyer hat. Um, I won't try to match the eloquence of Judge Chu, but I did want to sign up. Um, I am so proud to work with an organization that values its employees from the salaries from the top to the bottom, and that is taking a lead in raising the minimum wage. And I am proud, and I think other county employees are proud too, that you all have taken this leadership position. Um, I echo what Judge Chu has, has said about county employees. In, in my position, I've had the privilege of working like with all your staffs, and they have been amazing during um, the pandemic and before with all of the different employees in the different county departments from the clerks to the other lawyers and every single one of them i know puts their heart and soul into into working in a way that makes you all proud and makes the community proud so i'm also here in support of this wage um, adjustment. I think it's the fair thing to do and I think it's the right thing to do. I think Betsy has statistics on how um, inflation has affected El Paso and some of our employees. I heard this weekend that the dollar store is no longer the dollar store. And so that's a really good example of across the board, the, the rise in prices that we're seeing in gas and goods and food and it is affecting every single county employee like it's affecting every single El Paso one. So I urge you um, to adopt this proposal. I want a special thanks for Ms. Keller who has um, worked with the departments and kept us informed, kept us informed of the situation and understanding the financial situation and the commitment that each of you has to make to approve this. Um, so my sincere thank you. Joanne, thank you. Another trusting voice and uh, you know, we. Totally. We thank you for being here and supporting this. Thank you. Commissioner Stout. Uh, 
if you want to do the presentation for oh, a second. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Miguel, could you pull up the presentation for me, please? Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so just before we start talking about the fund balance proposals, um, I want to remind the court that this action, actually, this item, uh, well, I thank Joanne for the credit, this action item actually comes from Commissioner's Court. During strategic planning, Commissioner's Court, um, for several years now, you've had a goal and you re-upped that goal in your last strategic plan to raise the minimum wage. You often hear economic development items and you always ask, how does this affect the median county wage? And you always ask um, and look at those wages for jobs being proposed in these new businesses coming to El Paso. You also have taken the leadership to say, we're not only going to ask private business, we're going to ask the same of ourselves. So you've placed this as a goal upon yourself in your strategic plan and during budget. And you asked us to set aside funding for a wage adjustment to help move towards the court's goal of having a minimum wage for county positions to be $15 an hour above median county wage at this time. We're working towards that goal. We know that financially we have to be responsible to the taxpayer as well. And so we're working towards that goal over a period of time. This year our proposal is to move towards $13 an hour as a minimum wage without any wage compression for county pay scales. This item would bring minimum wage to, as I mentioned, to county positions to $13 an hour. It would be an 8% across the board adjustment to the general, professional, executive, and attorney pay scales, including salary supplements paid to AgriLife employees. It would also include grant funded positions and JPD employees. As you know, pay adjustments have already been provided for other employees in our pay classifications, including sheriffs, collective bargaining agreement, and deputy constables. This does not impact elected official pay. That was addressed earlier in the year. We've also worked diligently under your direction to be very close to an 8% fund balance and likely will achieve that goal in the near future. Um, I believe Commission, our uh, County Auditor Edward Dion is online. Um, the, that brings us to this slide. At the time of budget adoption, we believed our reserves were going to be 5.45%. We had a fund balance of $87,344,479. To date, under your direction, we've worked diligently to bolster that fund balance. Um, as of last Thursday, the projection um, was, or the balance was at $96,225,098 which estimates 7.63% in reserves. Uh, Mr. Dion did share with me the amount of additional revenue or expenditure reimbursement to reach the 8% goal would be an additional 1.5 million, which he believes is realistic based on additional reimbursement funds becoming available in the near future. We continue to work through reimbursement from agreements that we had <coughs> under the CARES Act <coughs> funds and with FEMA reimbursements. Our staff is working diligently. They know how important this is. Next slide, please. So again, our updated wage recommendation based on the goal to work towards $15 <coughs> over time, we're recommending $13 an hour, which is an 8% across the board adjustment to eligible employees to be implemented effective January 9th, 2022. And it impacts eligible employees on the mentioned pay scales. With that, I um, turn it over to the court for any questions or comments that you may have. Commissioner <clears throat> Stout. Thanks, Judge. Um, I just want to I just want to uh, make a couple of comments and um, you know thank our, our our staff for for working so hard on this over the over the, the past years. Um, I know when I remember when I first got into office and. Uh, 2015, we were paying well under $10 an hour, uh, and and just to to see the progress that we made, I mean that that became a very important policy priority for me. I remember working with with Commissioner Leon as well. I know this is a, a something that he has been a champion for, um, probably before I even got on the commissioner's court as well. And and uh, you know uh, I, I want to thank the past commissioner's court that that that. Um, uh, also worked on this, and and all of the advocates that have come across, that have come in, and uh, you know whether it's um, you know uh, some of the, the the local unions and 
other other advocates that have come into our offices to to push us to do this. Um, I, I think it's it's really um, been a um, one of the most important things that we've been able to do for our employees, uh, you know, and leading by example. I, I don't know how many other counties actually pay a living wage uh, to their to their lowest paid folks, as well as taking care of everybody at, at, at every single level. I, I think that we also made it a, a policy priority a number of years ago to pay our folks what the market says they should make, make sure that they are... Uh, um, uh, that they know that that that, that uh, we um, we support them, uh, that we we want them to uh, have the best uh, um, work experience here, and including getting getting paid what they deserve to be paid. And so I'm very proud of the fact that we're that we're getting here. We're finally uh, offering a, a living wage in El Paso County. We're we're not at the fifteen dollars yet, and I know that that's a national goal that we've been working on, uh, but. According to Workforce Solutions Borderplex, I think about $12.50 is what's considered a living wage in El Paso County because the cost of living here is a little bit lower. But as, we, as we've seen, as, as our county attorney stated, thing, uh, costs are going up. And so we're getting ahead, I think, a, a little bit here. And, and so we won't have um, as much to do to catch up later when we – and I hope, I hope we can just continually uh, increase – and keep it and, and keep it this rate and and keep moving towards um towards that 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 fifteen fifteen dollar an hour goal and um you know ma making sure that we take care of our taking care of our folks so i don't know if anybody think anybody else has anything to say but i want to move to approve the the item and just thank uh, everybody another advocate here is uh, commissioner leon please yeah thank thank you uh, thank you commissioner stott uh, Betsy, thank you. Uh, yes, I remember back since 2013, we've been talking about it and moving in that direction. And I've always thought of the commissioner's court as a pyramid with all the uh, county employees, but it is a reverse pyramid where uh, the commissioner's court is at the bottom. And just like the judge said, uh, if, if they don't look good, we sure don't look good. And all these events that I've gone to that we go to, uh, every week, you see the joy in our employees. They really genuinely want to do their job great. And especially the the voices we don't hear, uh, they're going to be at the $13 an hour. I mean, it's, that is so important to us. And, and, and uh, Judge Chu is right. The, those are the boots on the ground. Those are our faces uh, to the public. Uh, and uh, that's that's why we are, the success that we are is because of them. So. I, I'm very appreciative of prior courts, this court, that we really make an effort to make it right for those voices that uh, they won't approach you, but uh, we know they're out there. So thank you. Well, thank you both. And I think the overarching also is the, uh, that we set an example for the rest of the community, um, not just county or government, but uh, we've done a great job of moving forward in some initiatives and the way we treat our people and uh, we move uh, very well and uh, we become an example and then it gets others to want to do the same because out there, same thing. Uh, they struggled, uh, a lot of long hours, and so if we can get the rest of the community moving in that direction, um, it's going to happen. Let's, let's get ahead of the game. So thank you both. Judge, if I may. Yeah, Commissioner Olguin, please. Thank you, Judge. Um, I just also had a few comments that I wanted to make. Um, I remember at the beginning of our uh, budget hearings, one of the recommendations that we initially received was perhaps keeping the tax rate the same, uh, which would unfortunately um, still result in increasing taxes for our constituents because of the increase in valuations. But I want to actually thank um, the commissioner's court for, for uh, really deciding that it was important that we adopt the no new revenue rate um, so that we didn't have to place that additional tax burden on our constituents, but instead hold fast and make sure that we made our budget work with what we had. So I want to thank staff for all of their hard work to make sure that we were able to do that, that we're going to be able to maintain the 8% fund balance goal that we set um, forward from the beginning, that we've been able to get these reimbursements from the federal government. Um, I think the county is a tremendous example of a responsible 
budget uh, and the way that you go about passing a responsible budget. So um, I, I want to thank the staff for all of their hard work, but I also want to thank the commissioner's court for um, recognizing that, that we can um, pass a good budget, a responsible budget, and not pass along those costs to our constituents and still reward the employees that make the county a great place to work. So with that, I'd like to second Commissioner Stout's motion to approve the Great item. observation. Thank you. Go ahead, Jessica. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Um, definitely, I, I wanted to mention one more thing that, that, um, that I forgot in, in my remarks is that um, our advocacy is not only uh, helping employees here at the county, but also at the hospital district and at Emergence Health Network. All three of those public agencies that we have uh, some type of uh, authority within or, or purview within, uh, we've, we've been able to push the envelope in all three of them. And so, you know, they, I think that that's just amazing. You know, there's thousands of employees, that, um, hundreds of employees that are probably going to be, uh, uh, you know, receiving um, this benefit at, at UMC and, and as well as EHN. So we're not just pushing the envelope here at the county itself, but in other agencies. And, and uh, hopefully more will follow suit. So, again, aye. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Judge Commissioners, on behalf of all of our employees, we thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to say one other thing. I get so emotional when it comes to our employees. I, I'm so proud of them. Um, so I, I can't talk too much about that or else I'll, I'll lose my composure. But they do work so hard. But it is such a testament to this court that you do exactly what you're asking others to do. I mean, I hear you every time we bring an economic development item, I, I mention this because you, you push them on wages, but you're not afraid to push yourself on wages, and that's so commendable. And then, as you mentioned, Commissioner Olguin, um, that we don't, we, we're so conscientious to our community and our taxpayers, it just makes me extremely proud to be a county family member. Thank you. Jessica, we're ready for lunch. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, Commissioner's Court, would you like to recess for one hour? <laughs> for one hour, correct, Judge? Or, yes, sir. Okay, Commissioner's Court will recess for one hour. It is 12.03 p.m.
most of us have pets and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's un bebito, verdad? <laughs> from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive.
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
Most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's a bebito, right? <laughs> from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Eriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition. So these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Eriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. 
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. Es un bebito, ¿verdad? <laughs> from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. 
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
Most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, 
we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's a bebito, right? From a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelor's, 74 master's, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso.
come see what we can do together. Okay. Commissioner's Court has reconvened into regular open session. 
Item number nine from County Administration. We do have a correction to read in for the item. Approve and authorize the county judge to sign the second amendment to the consulting services agreement by and between the county of El Paso, Texas and Bickerstaff Heath Delgado Acosta LLP from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022 in the amount of $168,000. Funding is available in general fund, G admin, contract services, lobbyist, contract number 2021-0739. Good afternoon, Judge. Commissioners, Betsy Keller, County Administrator. This is our contract for our state lobbying firm, Bickerstaff, Heath, and Delgado. Um, we have uh, been in a contract since uh, 2019. This is, or actually, I'm sorry, 2018. This is a one-year extension to that contract. They are honoring, actually, a price that is a couple years old. Um, there was a third year with a price increase. They did not take that price increase at our request due to budget constraints. And we are asking for the court's favorable appro approval of this item. Um, second. I, I, I'll move to approve. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was just going to say I'm happy to, happy to move to approve. Um, uh, Claudia and, and, and Steve and, and Amy have been really a great asset for us at the state capitol. Uh, they really know what they're doing and have great relationships with, with so many legislators and have, have helped us get many pieces of important pieces of legislation across the goal line. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we can continue to be working with them. Yeah, very, very dedicated, very re re approachable and reachable. I mean, it's anything you need from so. Second. Commissioner Olgi? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Item number 13. Receive a report and discuss and take appropriate action regarding the CARES Act grant, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act 2021, and the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Jessica Garza from Budget and Fiscal Policy. In today's CARES report, expenses and purchase orders are at 25.6 million. Current commitments are at 1.7 million. And the overall remaining funds total just over 140,000. There is an overall change from the last report of 1.8 million as expenses are being finalized and purchase orders are closed out. This week's report reflects an expense of 1.1 million and a commitment of 1.4 million for eligible detention officer salaries from the general fund as authorized by the court on October 25th. We continue to work with the auditor and other departments to close out purchase orders and monitor the subrecipient agreements in order to utilize all remaining funds by December 31st. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Jessica. Questions? Just uh, Quick one. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Leon, please. But yeah, I, I know we have very little left as far as committed. Are, are we, I just don't want to leave any money on the table. We, we will not leave any money on the table. We have way more salaries that we could pay for than we will have funding. Okay, uh, perfect. Yes, sir. Um, Jessica, could you remind me, what is the uh, financial assistance, the funds that we have remaining for the financial assistance line item? That line item was ooh, um, made up of several different things. I believe this 114,000 was the rental assistance. So, so are those funds that we can still use for the rental assistance or, or why is it that those funds haven't been used? Do we know that, Betsy? I'll have to look and dive into that line item, Commissioner. Let me, let me find out exactly why, what, makes up that balance. Yes, please, thank you. So, if I may, um, we did receive an email from Irene that she was not going to be utilizing the remaining funds. And I believe it's because they received other sources of revenue or other sources of grants for that same purpose. And let me, let me double check that because I think there were different restrictions. Um, and I, I wanna verify that the other restrictions were less so that if there is somebody who would be in a gap, yes. that we, we have a coverage. And if not there, we would then uh, recommend it be paid from ARP funding. But yes. let me double check. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, Jessica. Um, there are no changes to the American Rescue Plan, Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds as the auditor is still creating the appropriate budgets and account codes for the projects approved by the court and we expect them to be complete by December 10th. This concludes today's update and I'm available for any other questions. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions? If not, thank you very much, Jessica. Appreciate that. Our best to Wally. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Have a good afternoon. And there will be no action for item number 13. Item number 14, discuss and take appropriate action regarding El Paso County's preparation and response for COVID-19. We have, I believe, Dr. Ocaranta on the line. Dr. Ocaranta? Excellent. Go ahead, doctor. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, commissioners and judge um, for this opportunity to present about COVID-19 in our community. If I may share my screen, I have a, a small presentation. Let me... Uh, very good. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Very good. In regards to COVID-19 in our community, we continue to see a very concerning increase in the amount of positive cases, but also in the hospitalizations. And unfortunately, after we see the increase in the hospitalizations, we start seeing an increase in the fatalities. We do not like to see that, and we are getting very close to 3,000 people passing away from COVID-19 complications in our community, and that is not a very good milestone that we want to reach. We continue to stress the importance about prevention and the foundation of these prevention plans are the vaccination, but also we like to continue to strongly recommend people to wear their face mask when they're gonna be indoors. There's gonna be plenty of opportunities during this holiday season to be exposed to somebody that is positive for COVID. And we need to be very cognizant about those situations. And this way we can prevent that by wearing your mask, washing your hands, and um, basically have a, a safe distance or the social distancing. We also need to care for those that are considered high risk, which is people with underlying conditions, people that are older than 65. And even though they have the vaccination, they can be infected either by their relatives or by going to these places where they can be exposed to a large amount of people. We'll see in a little bit about the hospitalizations and the characteristics of the hospitalizations that we are experiencing now in, in El Paso. In the dashboard, we're in stage two because of the large number of uh, positive cases, but also because of the hospitalizations. And if this changes that we see um, a higher attack rate in at risk population, the stage can move to stage one. Our hospitalizations, continue to be uh, greater than 350 patients uh, at this moment. And I think we're at about 360. And we haven't seen a decrease in the hospitalization, which is extremely concerning. On the positive cases, I'd like to go back a little bit. And the number of cases triple in just one month. And a third of those positive cases is on the pediatric population younger than 18 years of age. Our vaccination efforts continue between the multiple partners that we have to provide the vaccination, which includes city and also some other private providers such as Immunize El Paso, school districts and healthcare providers. We continue to see that the immunization rate is increasing and sometimes it slows down, but we have never seen it stagnant, which is a very favorable trend. This pandemic continues to be of the unvaccinated, in which a large percentage of the new cases and the vast majority of the hospitalizations are people that are unvaccinated. Hmm. These are the graph in regards to the uh, positive cases where we see a very sharp increase in the last three or four weeks. 
in the in zooming in in the cases where we're seeing the the this amount of cases we see that the increase is mainly uh, in the pediatric population 0 to 17 but mainly the school age children and that we're seeing that increase also concerning is the 66 years and older which we see the starts going up and those are the ones that can end up in the hospital as we're going to be seeing in just a little bit the school age children as we mentioned before the last four weeks we've seen a very sharp rise in the positive cases and we're experiencing this in school transmission where we're having a lot of positive cases within the schools we're working very closely with all the school districts in which we issue some new recommendations at the end of last week to strongly strongly recommend children and students teachers and staff to be wearing the mask when they're going to be during school session we do not need to forget again to all the parents all the adults if they're going to be indoors if they're going to be doing their holiday shopping choose only one person to go and do the holiday shopping and when you're going to be indoors wear your mask that's uh, one of the tools that we have to prevent infections and not only for COVID-19 but for many other respiratory viruses on the school age children we continue to see that the students in high school are leading the number of cases followed by the middle school and then the elementary school children and i want to put something about the vaccinated cases in which the cases uh, as we can see on the vaccinated cases it has a slight trend up but this is uh, more to show how the immunity wanes and how we're seeing that as the immunity wanes they're uh, capable of becoming infected particularly if they're at risk and they've been exposed they don't wear the mask and that's why we strongly recommend people that already received the two doses of the vaccine whether it's pfizer or moderna to come and receive the booster if they receive a johnson and johnson vaccine they can come and receive a booster and it doesn't matter if it's uh, any other brand name they can receive a pfizer and moderna and those that receive the pfizer and moderna they can come for the booster six months after they complete their immunization schedule and the johnson and johnson they can come two months after they they receive that that dose the waning of the immunity is directly related to the age and also the uh, comorbidities in which the older people have a faster waning of the immunity and that's what we're seeing that they can become infected and end up hospitalized due to that but nonetheless we continue to recommend the vaccination as a way to prevent hospitalization and death and we're going to see it in just a little bit the percentage of the people that are hospitalized compared to the positive cases we saw that that it was a little bit down but this is because of the large amount of positive cases that we're seeing that are not requiring hospitalization this is due to the vaccination that when people get vaccinated it is less likely that they're going to be hospitalized due to COVID-19 but the hospital near admissions this is how we're seeing that it continues to see an increase in that positive trend that we're seeing in the hospitalizations we need to remind the public that we don't have abundance in healthcare resources the hospital beds are very limited because we are facing a challenge in staffing a bed hospitals do not have enough of the healthcare personnel to staff a bed and we don't have that many beds available to care for people in large surges of COVID-19 because people are still suffering from heart attacks people are still suffering from strokes and any other medical conditions that require hospitalization so besides reminding the people to control their chronic conditions getting vaccinated to avoid hospitalizations and avoid those situations where you can get infected with COVID-19 are imperative. The percentage of hospitalization on our, on our trauma service area, I wanted to show this graphic, this illustration, so they can see how from the middle of October up to now, it continues an upward trend. And unfortunately, we have uh, been leading the state in the hospitalizations. Sometimes the uh, Amarillo trauma service area uh, takes the first place, but we also come and take that first place. But we're in the top places on the hospitalizations across the state. And this is not a very favorable trend that we're seeing. The age distribution and the people that are getting hospitalized 
the vast majority are older people or uh, older than 65 and older adults, which are making the, the highest percentage of hospitalizations at this moment. The amount of people that are vaccinated that are hospitalized, if you see that we have an increase in the percentage of people hospitalized that are fully vaccinated, but this is due to the waning immunity. And this is another one of the reasons why we strongly recommend to people to come and get the booster shot. Everybody who's older, year, uh, older than 18 years of age should come and receive the booster dose. There are plenty of opportunities and plenty of places where people can receive their booster dose. And there's pop-up events, there's events in schools, there's events in many other places across the county, and also the fixed locations where we're administering the vaccine. The fully vaccinated hospitalized, as expected, as I was mentioning, it is comprised of mainly the older population, which is 65 years of age and older, and also the older adults between 46 and 65. Uh, that, that is a, a big reminder of why we continue to recommend people to get the booster dose. And one graph and, and visualization that I like to bring back is to let people know that the vaccines are safe and effective and mainly effective in which we have a risk reduction in the cases by about 85% and also in the hospitalization of over 90%. This is very, very striking and that's how we can show the people that the vaccine works and the vaccination is one of the tools that we have in public health to prevent Again, um, more uh, morbidity and mortality and more the complications that we're going to be seeing due to the COVID-19. The people need to be aware that the complications after having an infection with COVID can persist for months and months and months, and those are called the long haulers, in which the vaccination, the reaction to the vaccine in many people is nothing. But in few people, it's going to be very short-lived between 24 and 48 hours. Some people might be a little hesitant because of that reaction, but having complications of the infection is something that can last for a long, long, long time. And sometimes uh, we don't know if it's going to be lasting a whole lifetime. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ucaranza. Dr. Ucaranza, I guess one of the challenges uh, and I think we learn a lot from being interviewed. And one of them is, you know, we're so highly vaccinated. Um, you know, why we're, why do we feel that this is t taking place, a spike, when we're highly vaccinated um, compared to some other areas that are not as highly vaccinated, yet uh, they're having a lower incidence of, uh, of the virus? Uh, so any conjecture or anything that you could uh, present to us? Uh, yes, sir. And we've talked a lot about the social determinants of health. We've talked a lot of how disadvantaged our population is because of the chronic conditions, because of the multi-generational homes that we have, because of the large percentage of people that have no ways of treating themselves because they have no insurance. So uh, the combination of that plus we have over 140,000 people that are not vaccinated that makes it a, a lot more likely that we're going to be seeing a large spike in the cases, but also in the hospitalizations that if plenty of those population that are unvaccinated get exposed, especially at a high transmission rate that we're having right now, then the likelihood that they might need hospitalization are a lot greater. So we need to be cognizant and that's what we need to continue caring for our loved ones that live with us grandparents, great-grandparents, or even our parents that have the diabetes, that have uh, the high blood pressure, and help them with the medication, help them achieve that control, and don't delay care. Mm -hmm. no, and, and I agree. I think the uh, vulnerability, but also that because it's sort of working against us, we feel that because we've been vaccinated and we got booster, then, uh, you know, the, the mask is, has not become as prevalent as we did at one time when the numbers came down. And so uh, I guess our message, continued message is, you know, to be aware of your surroundings, um, make sure that you are healthy, uh, you know, that's uh, take care of your health. That's gonna be the one of the first line of protection. 
Uh, but that, uh, you know, this idea that we're done kind of attitude is that, uh, you know, what's behind us. And uh, the numbers are not as alarming as they used to be. These numbers were very alarming at one time. And now they're seen as, you know, sort of an anomaly. It's going to go away by itself. So uh, we're working very hard. The uh, mayor and I are trying to figure out, uh, you know, how do we get that message along with you and, and others uh, that we're still, you know, in, in a, you know, a, a potential a crisis due to the healthcare care workers, uh, you know, that we don't have sufficient of, of them and all these other factors that uh, a lot of people in the hospital that are non-COVID uh, right now. So our, our ability to get to the capacity is going to be much quicker than before because we do have people staying longer and more non-COVID patients than we've ever had. So I think these things need to be understood uh, clearly by our community. Definitely, and very well said, Judge, and, and we need to continue practicing prevention. It's better mm -hmm. to prevent getting infected than trying to get uh, other treatments once we are infected, and, and that's why we continue to stress the importance about avoiding mm -hmm. getting infected, avoiding those complications, because they can last for a long, long, long time. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you for the message. Uh, Commissioner Stout, please. Um, thanks, Dr. O. Um, I just had a question. Is you know, is there any guidance you have um, <clears throat> for 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 agencies like El Paso County? Right, we just I think came back with our group to to full full staffing again, right? Or or we're back. We're, we're is there is there are there any suggested changes that we we think that we need to make um, to to make sure that we keep our employees safe or or the, the public safe? Um, because if we're seeing this. Increase and in, and we're um, going to have a lot more traffic here. For example, at the courthouse, is it, I mean, should be we be worried? Is there is there suggestions that you have with for that? Well, we continue to recommend the multi prong approach in which the people uh, may continue wearing their masks. We strongly recommend uh, more of the people that you have in the workforce to get vaccinated. And the root plan has been a great plan because it addresses each one of the departments individually, but also collectively in, in which one, if one department feels that they're more at risk or they're seeing any other risk that maybe the other departments don't have, they can revert to, to a different approach without affecting the rest of the operations in the county. The county is, is is comprised of many departments that are very, has very unique features that we need to recognize in the group uh, committee led by Nicole and, and Mr. Martinez and everybody that participated in the root plan. It's a very well thought and design plan that, that definitely I'm very happy with that. And, and he has that potential of reverting in case they need to, but also continue advancing and, and continue providing the services that the constituents need. Yeah, so I, so I guess what, what's the threshold that we're looking at when it comes to reverting back to, to, to going back down to something? If, if, I, if I could add just a comment, what the judge has done in the, with the ROOP, um, uh, they've left a lot of flexibility with us as department heads. Right. So, for example, as we see cases ticking up, we now that we have the ability to allow employees to work remotely, we also have the ability, regardless of the group, to internally, like, notch down. So, for example, in my office, I'm trying to make sure we don't have more than three people on site at any one time. So there's that independent department discretion to do that. But um, at some point, I think, Commissioner, what you're asking is if at some point there's not a county order to, to go back to a different level. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> and the ROOP committee is continuing to meet and discuss that. Okay. And then another question I had, so just to, I guess, make things clear for, for the public, because I've gotten calls from lots of constituents about... Um, you know, going back to mask mandates, for example, in schools, because we're seeing such a in large increase in the in the student population that that's that's getting uh, getting sick or or contracting the virus. Um, we at this point don't have really many legal options because there was a um, I guess it was a Supreme uh, a Court of Appeals decision that was 
emitted recently uh, that that preempted the whole state from being able to do this. I think before that came down, we were we were preempted because of the because of the fight that we got into with with the governor and the state um, before, right? And so we were under another court ruling, and then now. Um, because of this new court ruling, it's the whole state is is preempted from being able to have mass mandates at school. Is that correct? Well, well I'd like to, Anna, if you don't mind. I, I, I hate for you to get up like that, but um, we met with Dr. Caranza at the, you know, <laughs> Gina Perez uh, came to talk to us about some possibility, and, and it's it's a, if you, Anna, you might want to address that and what took place in our meeting last week. The attorney. So last week we did meet um, the judge, Dr. Ocaranza, and a representative of the state um, school, TEA. And essentially we discussed one of the cases, which is I think possibly what you were referring to, Commissioner Stout, that there was potentially a window, right, that schools could act more quickly through an ADA federal case. Unfortunately, that window did close last week when there was an adverse decision that was issued um, by the Fifth Court of Appeals. We were more hopeful that that was going to be a better venue going through federal court as um, the Court of Appeals have now issued um, conflicting decisions um, in other parts of Texas that had received favorable decisions, but ultimately we see that going to the Texas Supreme Court and not being potentially favorable once it reaches that stage. Um, the schools are evaluating other options um, that I won't disclose at this point, um, but, but they're, they were hopeful that in seeing Dr. Ocaranza's order come out last week, or not order, a, rec a strong recommendation, that it would really encourage schools to take some form of action. But Commissioner Stout is absolutely correct that unfortunately at, at, this, at this point in time, there's not a lot of legal options. So we, did we lose that opportunity for, a, um, for the superintendent to uh, to be able to use the, uh, uh, what did you call it, uh, the ADA, the, the uniform kind of. So, th so that's another option that has been considered by several organizations for several months now, right? Can you require it as part of of a uniform? Um, we have not evaluated that on behalf of schools. Um, we were evaluating the ADA case in terms of, you know, does the governor's order prevent schools from providing reasonable accommodations to students under the ADA? And also, is it basically in contravention of the ARP um, because they couldn't basically implement the most, um, use the money in such a way that would allow them to address COVID, both of which were very interesting um, arguments, but ultimately there were pretty serious uh, concerns with standing that was raised by the court. Um, and so that's the reason that came down. But we haven't particularly judge evaluated um, the uniform provisions with regards to schools. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. I guess, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Caranza, and I think we have a chief on the line as well. Yes, thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Just a brief update on where at uh, from the operational perspective uh, as part of our COVID response. Just uh, an update on the numbers uh, in terms of uh, our vaccinated population. We are at 86.78 for those uh, 12 of year, I'm sorry, five years old and older, uh, and 70.94 of those fully vaccinated uh, older than the age of five. Uh, our elderly population, uh, those older the, over the age of 65 continue to do well. Uh, one dose, we're at 99.9 .9 and 92.25 fully vaccinated. Um, we are we have seen an increase in vaccines over the last several weeks. Uh, we've been averaging close to 20,000 uh, per week for for almost the last month. Uh, last week we did, uh, and those numbers are going to continue to increase as information comes in. But we did 18,003 uh, vaccines last week, and uh, prior uh, week to that was also close to that to that number. A uh, brief uh, update on, on infusion centers. Uh, as you all know, uh, the hospitals of Providence, through a partnership with the city of El Paso, has been operating a uh, in infusion center site. Uh, they're going to be receiving additional staff uh, to help with additional uh, appointments. Uh, but also, on, on top of that, since we, we, we feel that infusions, uh, the monoclonal infusions for antibodies are going to be uh, a, a great strategy for us to minimize hospitalizations, uh, we worked with the Department of State Health Services with the state to bring in a uh, a regional infusion center. Uh, they will be going operational tomorrow, 
at our Alameda clinic. Um, they'll be operating seven days a week from 7 p.m., excuse me, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, this will be a doctor's referral process. Uh, we'll be posting this information and also issuing a press release with more detailed information um, uh, later this afternoon. Um, we will, uh, of course, uh, continue to do vaccines and, and provide boosters throughout the community at our various COVID clinics and the convention center remains uh, up and operational. We're also doing pop-up events uh, throughout the community uh, to include events for children uh, the age of, of 5 through 17. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll be providing more information also on, on, on testing um, and, and increased hours uh, that, that we'll be sending out later this afternoon. Uh, but with that, I turn it back to the court if you all have any questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's been a lot of concern that if we're doing enough for the infusion and keeping, um, and I, I've said, you know, we're trying to do the best that we can. I think we need to promote it a little bit better, but uh, we'll try to do as much as we can on, on that uh, press conference coming up. Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Judge, I had one, one real quick yes, question. Uh, Commissioner Stout, please. Um, uh, uh, thank, thanks, Chief. Do, do, you, do we have um, an idea or data on, I guess, how many, how many folks are, are actually um, coming over from Quadras and getting vaccines here um, since the border's been back open? Is that, is that something that we're <laughs> tracking? Yes, sir. That, that's a good question. Uh, we are, are looking to see what, what that impact is. We have seen uh, increase in cases that are, or I'm sorry, not an increase in cases, but increase in, in vaccination rates, uh, particularly for the clinics that are closer to the border. So uh, we, I know we have seen some impact, uh, particularly at the convention center, but no, we are going through that data to see if we can assess it. We don't ask for, for nationality, uh, so it's, it's not a very clear picture, but we, we are making that analysis. Uh, as soon as we have more information, we'll, 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 we'll uh, update the court. And, and it would probably have to be children, right, since you have to, or the booster, because you're having, you need the two vaccinations yeah. to cross. So I'm assuming that, Correct. I was hoping that children would be the ones that uh, would pick up. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner. And, and, and are, there, are there still efforts going on to try to bring vaccines to Juarez? I know, I know we talked about you know, some of the, like, vaccinating kids now, yeah. working on vaccinating kids. Can we have an update on what that? Yeah, I'll have it on my okay. presentation. Okay. Um, and then one more question I had. Are we going to be um, participating at all in the vaccination efforts that are going to be taking place now that the migrant protection protocol is going to be put back into place and, and the Biden administration is going to, and, and the Biden administration is going to be, vaccinating the folks that are, are are entering into that program do you do you know if we're if we're being we're involved in that at all we have not received any information on whether or not uh, assistance will be required from from the city or for the county uh, but we'll follow up with uh, our immigration officials and see if, if they have a process in place that they'll uh, let us know what what if, if any if they'll have any needs from us yeah, I missed the call on, on I missed the call that we had Friday, and and I would have probably asked in if I, if I would have been on, but I, I I received a call from the intergovernmental folks at the at the White House, letting us know that we're that they were going to be re reinstituting that program, and part of the stipulation was that they were going to be vaccinating folks, and so I I wanted to make sure that we're if we can being as helpful as possible if if need if need be to 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 make sure that that uh, things run smoothly and that, that those folks get vaccinated. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chief. Betsy, back to you. Thank you, Judge. Next will be updates from Commissioner's Court. Judge, do you want to get us started? Sure, very quickly. Um, about a week ago, we started to see the numbers increasing a little dramatically, so I asked to have a press conference for Wednesday that's coming up. And I thought, you know, at that point we should be getting more numbers on, you know, the bridges opening, Thanksgiving, you know, Black Friday, all of these numbers would be coming in and it looks like it's, it's happening and we'll still have a couple of days to, to look at that. Uh, so it's a, a, a big opportunity, depending on, on the numbers, to be able to discuss some of these strategies and of course uh, Dr. Carranza and 
and Chief have always supported us on that. Uh, so we'll, I'm looking forward to to see what what's coming up. It doesn't look good, you know. It doesn't look as as bright as we would like to to see it. Um, on the Juarez, uh, we already have like 17,000 children that have registered. It's been just so difficult because it's two twice, uh, and the parent has to be with them on the bus. Um, it was really up to ESD number two. Uh, their board uh, could have said, um, you know, had asked. We asked them if there was any way that we would not, we could just have one chaperone on the bus because that would really facilitate. So instead of having 50, we actually have 25, 25 kids and their parents, uh, unless they have one or two children. So that's been really difficult. The board uh, voted uh, not to take that uh, condition off. Uh, you know, we talked to uh, Commissioner Garcia, and she was like, okay, we, you know, you're, you're able to just get an approved. But have been that it's international, and we don't have a lot of control over the documents. We would hate for some child to to get vaccinated and the parent didn't allow it or, or, or you know, just too much uh, liability uh, in that situation. So it's up to the board and uh, they didn't vote uh, for that. Uh, so still working hard on, as you can imagine, you have to have the parent, which means a parent very likely work. Both parents probably work. So to coordinate having the parent available having the child and then coming back twice, and the cost is twice as much as Tornillo. The Tornillo project was 500000 This would be $1 million. Uh, and it wouldn't be, you know, would, the maquiladora is going to help a little bit, uh, but uh, in talking to Perez Cuellar, uh, the alcalde, he's um, uh, the mayor, he's very supportive and wants this to happen. So we haven't let, it, let go of it, uh, but we obviously um, are having some challenges on that. Uh, we did, like I said, we did talk to, uh, with Gina and, you know, thank you, uh, Dr. Ocaranza. We asked for a strong letter of recommendation, hoping that somehow some of the, you know, the superintendents might pick that up and use that as leverage. Uh, but we're testing that out, as, as we have said. Um, you know, the infusion centers, that's going to be something very important because right now we're almost headed into that, uh, that situation. We've got COVID, um, non-COVID more than ever before, uh, delayed treatment and all the things that Dr. Ocaranza spoke about. So we're, we're hoping that um, the infusion will be some way to curb that, the amount of uh, individuals that are going into our hospitals. Um, like I said, you know, a little bit of concern with the messaging that uh, I'm fully vaccinated, but I got COVID and uh, other people hearing it and saying, well, then maybe I shouldn't get vaccinated. So. We got to really strengthen our, our message to our community, and uh, so working very hard trying to get uh, individuals to to realize that it worked before. Uh, when they're saying that some areas are are not masking and low and low um, you know, vaccination rates are and don't have the spike, uh, that's really confusing for our community. So uh, we're trying our best to to figure out you know what's what's really taking place. We've always said that we're a very unique community. And we also know we're very vulnerable. I mean, we just have one of the highest indices of heart issues and diabetes and cancer. Uh, so that makes us extremely vulnerable to, to that. So that's what we should be looking at uh, ourselves in a unique way and that we're very vulnerable and we need to protect. You know, that number of hitting 3,000, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about it maybe six months ago that we might not hit it and now we're obviously uh, very close to that number, and uh, so if anything, we should do it in honor of the of the individuals that um, that have died, and uh, do the best we can that we don't have more people dying on us. So uh, that's what I have, uh, Betsy, at this point in time. Thank you, Judge Commissioner Leon. Yeah, something real quick. Uh, I'm, I'm sure by now you've seen the county November issue, and just a quick shout out to. Uh, Constable Ugarte, who was featured in a small article yeah. there of uh, everything they've been involved in during the year. And it's a small article, but it really shows what we were talking about earlier today, that our, our, our employees are doing such a great uh, job out there. And it's being noticed by a statewide run uh, publication. And uh, uh, Constable Ugarte, if you're listening, I know he was at some conference. Congratulations and good job. Thank you for that, Commissioner. That was a great, great article. Thank you. 
I have nothing to update. Thank you. I just wanted to um, just take a really quick moment to remind all of our seniors out in the county that the UMC um, uh, mobile unit is going to be out administering boosters for our senior community. So this Thursday, they're going to be at our Agua Dulce Self-Help Center. I believe the hours are from 9 to 1. Uh, but just again, um, just keeping on this topic of trying to make sure everybody um, gets vaccinated or gets their boosters if they already are vaccinated. Um, I want to thank Irene and her team for uh, putting this together and making sure that we continue to make um, vaccines available to our senior community out in the outer county areas. Thank you, Commissioner. Rogin. That is something that the task force discussed is that not everybody realizes that you're eligible for a booster if, um, if you've had two vaccines and it's been six months and if you receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and it's been <clears throat> at least months. two months, they recommend that you get a second dose of the Johnson & Johnson or a booster. <clears throat> so um, that was something that they was emphasized at the task force meeting as well this last week. If that's um, it for the court, we don't have any other updates under this item. Thank you, Betsy. Jessica? Judge. In no action for item number 14. Item number 21, auditor. Pursuant to the Texas Local Government Code, section 114.023, 114.024, 114.025, 114.026, 114.027, 114.028, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 
But property taxes, I will just let you know that even though it shows a decline, this is nothing we panic about because back in 2019, we had a, a lot of people prepaying their taxes because there were tax consequences. And really, they don't have to pay their taxes till January. And, and most of the time, people don't pay till January. So between December, October and December, we have a variety of people that every year decide when they're going to pay their taxes, and it varies. So in January, it all nets out, and, and it ends up turning out good. So I don't anticipate any loss in revenues. This is really a, a timing difference as to when taxpayers decide to pay. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just the uh, revenues by source budget actual for fiscal month one. Shows that we're 8.3% through the year. Uh, shows the budget of 329 million. And the revenues of 3.7 shows that we've uh, collected 1.1% of revenues uh, year to date. Next slide, please. The, the one thing I'll just point out is that sales tax, we do not receive sales tax in the month of, of October because there's a lag in the receipt of, of funds from the comptroller. We usually get sales tax two months in arrears from when it actually is, in, is incurred and collected. So the first payment will be in, no, in, in November, but we did receive a payment in October and we did receive a payment in November. And both of those months, I'll tell you that, that they were still up 15% in October, 16% in November. So you'll see those good results still coming through. So this is just the pie of revenues by source. Uh, I think just all the information is there about all the revenues to the county. And then we usually break it out by the component you can see taxes, uh, the, the majority of the of the revenue that comes from the county is 51%. 51.47% was, was taxes, and within that, 99.6% was property taxes. So, uh, next slide, please. This is one of the ones that I'm going to exclude. It just shows charges for services as a component, and it just breaks out the uh, various components or the departments that collect revenues within that category. Next slide, please. Another one that will be excluded, this one uh, talks about fines and, and fees, fines and forfeitures, shows the departments within those categories that bring in revenues. Next slide, please. This is the component for intergovernmental revenues. Same thing, shows the breakdown. I'll be excluding these because it's really a, a redundancy from the, from the table and the information is in the actual report. Next slide, please. This is the three year uh, budget actual comparison. Just shows you the whole uh, revenue budget, shows you how much uh, actual collected as presented to the budget, which is 1.11. And the budgeted property taxes shows that we've collected 0.88%. Like I say, that varies drastically sometimes uh, between October and December. And then the budgeted sales tax, we don't collect in October. You'll see a payment coming through in November. And it's still up. Next slide, please. This is the three year comparison for ad valorem property taxes. We'll be excluding this one too, because as you can see, there's not much different between one year and, and, the, and the next. It's usually a bell curve. It usually comes in between November and February. Next slide, please. Same thing here, sales tax. It's, it's pretty redundant, although uh, due to COVID, we had some uh, significant increases. So show, showing the different years actually shows you shows you that deviation. And some people really say a, 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 a picture's worth a thousand words. So if that's a preference the court has, we can always leave that in. But at this point, we're proposing taking it out. Next slide, please. This one we'll, we'll leave in. The commissioners requested when you know we have changes in sales tax. You know where are the changes occurring? So based on that, we'll leave this slide in. The retail showed um, an increase of about 333,000 or 14.8%. Uh, we had increase in accommodations and food services by 150,000 or 25.4%. We had wholesale trade, an increase of 58,754 uh, or 18.72%. And then information was 62,273 increase or 23.06%. So you can kind of get an idea of, of where the, the money's being spent that brings in that additional sales tax. Charges for services, this is another one that we're going to be excluding. 
it does show aberrations from year to year, but uh, the information is still in the table and it'll be in the master report. Next, next slide. Did anybody have a question? I'm sorry, I'm going pretty fast. We're fine, Edward. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, this one's fines and forfeitures. Next slide. Same thing, three year comparison. We'll be excluding this one. Forfeitures went up by about little over almost 3,000 or 1.35%. Okay, next slide, licenses, permits, same thing. We're gonna exclude this one. And basically it was an increase of 12,477 or 78.97%. Okay, on to expenses. Next slide. Summary of expenses by fund. Shows all the funds, as I said, we'll be consolidating adult probation or West uh, El Paso, West Texas Community Supervision and Corrections. Um, 32.6 million month to date, same to, for year to date. Next slide, please. Here's another one. It's a comparison of the salaries fringe and operating and capital uh, one year to the next. I don't think we have this in a table and we're talking about excluding it, but we'll we'll talk about it internally to make sure we can provide something in the master report that still uh, identifies this information. Uh, personnel and benefits uh, increased by about 9 million or 88.45%, uh, I'm sorry, it was a decrease compared to the prior year. Um, operating expenses were, we had uh, 1 million increase or 11.99%. And then we had capital outlays were 38,000 or 0.36% of the total expenses. And the year-to-date increase was 24,000 compared to 21. And then no changes on transfers out. And next slide, please. Okay, this is just a comparison of the budget of 22 versus 21 of how much is expended year-to-date. Uh, we're gonna exclude this one also. The chart shows, you know, just the expenditures from one year to the next, it's slightly lower compared to last year. Um, but like I say, it's, uh, I don't think it provides a lot of data. Next one. Uh, general fund expenses by function. Uh, this one we're going to go ahead and leave in and show stuff. Just budget actuals, uh, year-to-date actuals, and the percentage of the budget expended so far. So so far, 2.63% uh, of the budgets expended so far. And then we have to exclude 19.3 million, which is designated for unforeseen emergencies, which uh, in reality that's considered not to be expended at all unless we have another issue like we did at the beginning of COVID. Next slide, please. The expenditure comparison shows year to year, and it'll show you each uh, function, shows you the, uh, the amount change, percentage change. So overall, um, we show 10 million and, and 10.5 million in 22, 21 was 11.4 million. So a change of, the, of the, it's a de basically, it's an, it's been an increase of 841,000. No, I'm sorry, it's a decline. It went down from 11. So it's a decline of 7.37%. And uh, the variety of those uh, changes, uh, I'll go through the detail on subsequent uh, monthly reports just to, just to make sure you still get the additional information. Uh, next slide, please. This one shows those functions also, and it just shows two, the two fiscal years, one compared to the other. And like I say, this information from the prior table will exclude this one unless we see there's a preference to keep it in. Next slide, please. This is the uh, general fund expenditures year to date, shows how much is expended, and then it shows you the, the function as the components of that slice of the pie. That will stay in there. Next slide, please. Um, this is the uh, same as on the revenue side. This is general government. Uh, we're going to exclude it. It's just breaking down further each component, each function, and the departments that fall within those, those functions. Next slide, please. Same thing here, administration of justice showed 2.64 uh, million or 24.96% of expenses to date. Next slide. Another one to be excluded, public safety, 5.28 million or 49.92% of expended. Next slide is the uh, other functions, which will be excluded also with the, with the detailed departments and it'll be in the master report as I said. Last, uh, next to the last slide, this is the fund balance. Uh, at the time that uh, this report was put out, I was I was projecting about 92 million. It, it kind of goes up and down, up and down. Um, as of last week, with additional information that was provided through county administration and for all the work that the auditor's office and other departments have been doing, 
to identify uh, reductions to encumbrances, expense reimbursements, and uh, new funding. Um, as Betsy said earlier in item 12, the projected fund balance right now is $96.2 million. And that amount, uh, if we have additional CARES funds that become available and unspent, we do have uh, additional patrol salaries that uh, we would be able to reimburse the general fund for, which will bring that $96 million amount even higher. And it should be, we should be successful in meeting our 8% goal on the fund balance reserve. Uh, the one other question that I always get on the year end budget, which is not final yet, but how much of the of the budget is remaining? Um, Commissioner Holguin asked last time, and at this point, we're showing we're going to have about forty five point eight million dollars unexpended or appropriations remaining, or twelve point four nine percent. Typically, on average, it's about eleven percent. So we're just a little bit higher than the average. And with that, on the last page of the report for next month, uh, as um, we're, uh, indicated, we're going to just show a summary of the table of contents. We're going to show a hyperlink uh, to the actual report. So if the public gets into the presentation, they'll be able to get to the report a lot easier and it'll be a summary. With that, does anybody have any questions? Great job, Edward. Thank you. Great job, Edward. Questions? Thank you. We do not, Edward, but thank you. And thank you for trying to get the uh, uh, less, more, the same information, but in, in less. Uh, slides. I think that'll be very helpful. Next month should be a lot shorter and more concise, but like I say, any feedback you all can give us, we'll definitely make changes. Thank you, Edward. Thank you and your team. Could we Thank please you. have a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Good afternoon, Edward. Thank you. You all too. Stay safe. Thank you. Item number 22, Budget and Finance. Approve and authorize the creation of a budget for the Tourist Promotion Program Agreement, contract number 2021-0521. And we do have a request from the Budget and Fiscal Policy Department to have this item deleted. I vote. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. I just want to clarify for the court. We asked that that be deleted because it was included already in the item on consent. So we mm. didn't, we were duplicating. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This now brings us to item 23, executive session. Commissioner's court will now recess into executive session to discuss items 23A through 23G pursuant to Texas government code section 551.071 and 551.074. Commissioner's court will reconvene to take official action.
most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's un bebito, verdad? It's a from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter, at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive.
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's un bebito, verdad? It's a from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive.
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks, uh, we do foster transportations, uh, we do adoptions, we do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. Es un bebito, ¿verdad? Es un... From a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter, at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive.
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's a baby, right? From a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large US cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the US-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelor's, 74 master's, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. 
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
Most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help.
Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks, uh, we do foster transportations, uh, we do adoptions, we do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. Es un bebito, ¿verdad? It's a from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. Es un bebito, ¿verdad? <laughs> from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county, where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home, and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition, so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. 
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
most of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are kind of sporadic. It's a lot of terrain to cover. Today's mission is to collect some puppies and a little pig on the outskirts of the county. It's un bebito, verdad? <laughs> from a man who no longer has enough resources to support them. In 2020, the Animal Welfare Department rescued a total of 1,769 animals, of which 231 were returned to their owners and 418 were adopted. <laughs> After giving the men information about the spayed and neutered services, Heriberto takes the puppies and the little pig to a shelter on the other side of the county where they will find a family for them. The name of the rescue here is uh, Almost Home and it's a big uh, foster affiliate of ours. They help us a, a lot with, uh, with our transition so these dogs don't uh, set foot at the shelter at the animal services. After leaving the animals in good hands, Heriberto drives away to a new mission. El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive.
We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
of us have pets, and we know that we have to take care of them and give them a home with love. But when our resources are not enough, we need to find out a better life for them. Fortunately, here in El Paso, the Animal Welfare Department is here to help. Every morning, the officers of the El Paso County Animal Welfare Department get into their trucks and set up for different parts of the county to help citizens with their pets. My main job is to protect, capture and care for animals, uh, educate the community. Uh, we do everything from our trucks. Uh, we do foster transportations. Uh, we do adoptions. We do microchipping. El Paso County is one of the largest counties in the state of Texas and its animal welfare department has only eight officers to cover all the land outside the city. Uh, the county is very big in terrain. It's bigger than the city, actually, um, but the houses are... Commissioner's Court has reconvened into a regular open session. Item number 24, discuss and take appropriate action regarding litigation styled Alicia Lopez Mora versus the County of El Paso, Texas, et al. Cause number 2021, DCV 1566, County Attorney, case number 0108-21-LD. Item number 25, discuss and take appropriate action on subrogation claim regarding Martin Salazar, County Attorney, file number 0172-21-PC, and their corresponding executive items, number 23F, discuss litigation styled Alicia Lopez Mora versus the County of El Paso, Texas, et al., cause number 2021, DCV 1566, County Attorney, case number 0108-21-LD, pursuant to Texas Government Code section 551.071, and item number 23G, discuss subrogation claim regarding Martin Salazar, County Attorney's File Number 0172-21-PC, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.071. Could we please have a motion to postpone all these items for so one week? So moved. Second. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon is absent. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. And this concludes all the items on today's agenda, Judge. Okay, thank you. Thank you all of you for all your work. I see how the attorneys are lined up one behind each other, so. <laughs> it's a different strategy, so thank you. Dario and Salina, thank you very much for being with us all day. Thank you. This concludes today's meeting at 4.29 p.m. We made it.